Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the San Jose Planning Commission meeting. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I want to beg your forgiveness. This is my first time being chair, so you all get to muddle through this with me. In addition to that, our technology isn't working, so we're going to have to do things the old-fashioned way and actually vote um, by saying aye. So with that, um, I think we have a recording of like our procedures and a summary of our procedures. Welcome to a meeting of the San Jose Planning Commission. The following is a summary of the Planning Commission's hearing procedures. If you want to address the Commission, please fill out a speaker card located on the table near the audiovisual technician and deposit the completed card in the basket. There are also speaker cards in the back of the chambers and at the side entrance. The procedure for this hearing is as follows. After the staff report, Applicants and appellants may make a five-minute presentation. The chair will call out names on the submitted speaker cards in the order received. As your name is called, please line up in front of the microphone at the front of the chamber. Each speaker will have two minutes. Speakers using a translator will have four minutes. After the public testimony, the applicant and appellant may make closing remarks for an additional five minutes. Planning commissioners may ask questions of the speakers. Response to commissioner questions will not reduce the speaker's time allowance. The public hearing will then be closed and the planning commission will take action on the item. The planning commission may request staff to respond to the public testimony, ask staff questions, and discuss the item. If you challenge these land use decisions in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at this public hearing or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. The Planning Commission's action on rezonings, prezonings, general plan amendments, and code amendments is only advisory to the City Council. The City Council will hold public hearings on these items. Section 20.120.400 of the Municipal Code provides the procedures for legal protests to the City Council on rezonings and prezonings. The Planning Commission's action on conditional use permits is appealable to the City Council in accordance with Section 20.100.220 of the Municipal Code. Agendas and a binder of all staff reports have been placed on the table near the door for your convenience. Thank you. So we also need to do a roll call, and so uh, for the record, all commissioners are present, correct? Except Pierre Luigi Oliverio. Thank you. Um, and we also need to do a salute to the flag. So let us rise to salute the flag. All right, so we're going to launch right into our agenda. Um, and the first one is call to order and orders of the day. Is there anything else that needs to be said about that? Okay, moving on to public comment. I have one speaker card, I believe, for the public comment section, and that is Tessa Woodmancy. Memo. What? What happened? Everybody listening? Yeah. 
Good, climate and ecological crisis that we are facing, it's even worse than we even thought. It's the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the United Nations supported panel called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And their 2018 report, I hope you're taking notes, this is very important. Their 2018 report about how to keep our society, how to keep our world at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels means that we need to re reduce our emissions 50 percent, that's five zero, 50 percent by 2030. That's 10 years, okay? So start panicking. Like Greta Thunberg, we need to panic because our house is on fire, is what Greta says. And she's right. She's a climate scientist. Write that down. Not a climate science. Climate activist at 16 years old, Sweden. And 1.6 million children are protesting around the world. It's called the butterfly effect. When one person does something and it really spreads. And we need it to do it now, too. We need to change. We need human change, not climate change. And now what's happening is that they, in the IPCC report of 2018, how to keep it at 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels, we are now burning in the Arctic. And that was never even recorded, a part of the, the, the analysis. The Arctic is burning, okay? That means nature is, cooking, is kicking in. It's called, it's called a, um, it's the feedback effects, but it's really called nature. It's the, um, the tipping point. We have reached the tipping point. It's happening, okay? Climate emergency, nature is kicking in, adding carbon dioxide, never even recorded in, the 20, in terms of the IPCC report of 2018. Right now, it's on fire, our Arctic. That's Alaska and it's uh, Siberia on fire, adding to our carbon dioxide. We need to be at zero fossil fuel emissions in 10, what the uh, Extinction Rebellion says, zero in 2025, and that's what we need. So that's my comment. Thank you, Tessa. And because, just so folks know, because the technology isn't working, we're doing uh, timing the old-fashioned way. So I've got a timer up here, and once we get to um, more of the public comment, you each have two minutes. And my, <laughs> my phone rings. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Great, thank you, Peter. So next item, we have deferrals and removals from calendar. And so staff, is there anything we need to know on this item? No update. All right, moving on to the consent calendar. Um, typically on consent, what that means is these items, unless pulled, uh, get voted on in one fell swoop with no discussion, but we have two speaker cards, one for each item. So uh, I believe that means we're automatically pulling these items off consent. Um, and so process-wise, do we want to just take public comment and then have a staff report or? Great, but did I take public comment first and then staff report? Okay. So we're going to go ahead and call Tessa down to the podium on item 4A. Uh, okay, good. Madam so Chair, I, okay. are we going to introduce the project first? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yes. Introduce the project? Yeah, brief. All right, go ahead. Oh, do you want to? Can I ask you to pause for a moment? Yeah. I'm being advised no, that I... Go back. No, no, you don't need to okay. move. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm being told I need to officially open public hearing. All right, you're doing great. Do All right, go ahead. Oh, you're done? Okay. All right, so this was a, um, an issue that looked like it was development, from what I can understand um, of this uh, project, that it was developing property. And under a climate emergency that we need to just declare, the city of San Jose needs to declare a climate emergency. And other cities and other countries have declared a climate emergency. That's United Kingdom, you've heard of it? UK, declaring a climate emer emergency. San Francisco, Berkeley, Los Angeles. City of San Jose needs to declare a climate emergency. And when we declare a climate emergency, we have hooks to make decisions differently. 
Tessa, the three Tessa, things my can I is can I ask you to pause for a moment? Yeah. We'd like you to speak to the item that's I'm, on the I'm agenda. I'm talking about development. Yeah, I'm talking about development. And saying no to all development is what I'm saying, because. We when need we, you to speak we, to this item specifically. I am speaking to the item that they are talking about development. And what we need to do under a climate emergency is we have to have nothing, no, we're not supposed to talk about economics or politics or religion. All we need to talk about is um, biology, physics, and engineering. And under that, we should have no development. So we need to stop. We need to start going, d d decreasing our economic development. We need to be, if we're supposed to reduce 50% in the next 10 years, that means 5% depression every year, and that's 10 on top of each other. 10 depressions. So that will be no development. So that's what I'm commenting on, on this thing. There should be no development. We need to be going into a depression. And part of it is in relationship to uh, open space. We need to keep open space open so that we can grow food, because that's the issue we're dealing with, is trying to survive as a species. And that's the issue. Extinction, you've heard of that? It could happen. It's happened five times before. And when we raise our carbon dioxide, that's what happens. We can go into extinction. Thank I know you. It doesn't seem very Thank interesting, you, but it's true. Thank you. Your time is up. Do I need to close the public hearing? Do I need to ask? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and officially close the public hearing and then ask the commission if they have any questions. Uh, we don't know. If the applicant is here and they would like to speak, they are welcome to. Madam Chair, I'll move approval. Second. Staff recommendation. Second. All right. Read the item out. Do you want no? <laughs> All right. This is item four A. We have a motion and a second. Matthews. So. All those in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Is that, uh, any abstentions? All right, motion passes unanimously. All right, moving on to item 4B. On this one, we also have a speaker card, and that is Tessa Woodmancy. So I'm going to officially open the public hearing. And tell Tessa, welcome. Um, what I understood about it was something to do with like um, re reducing or not including environmental impact. So I don't really understand it exactly, but under a what we're what we're facing in terms of um, climate crisis, climate collapse, but we also have an ecological collapse. That's what's happening, ecological collapse. So any way that we're in some ways reducing or eliminating environmental review is very detrimental to life on Earth because right now a million species are going extinct. They're saying like in our lifetime. So, or I have to look that up exactly, but there was a big report. It's called the IP, P, peanut butter environment it's ipbec and it's uh, it's a it's, it's about the um issue of our that we have a climate collapse not a climate ecological collapse that we're losing a million species and so we re really need to like i said only be dealing with um biology physics and engineering nothing to do with economics we'd have to stop economics as being an issue we have to stop politics as being an issue and religion the, and we are at the the last microsecond of of survival potential survival so all we should be talking about is climate emergency so we can save ourselves 
And so any reductions in environmental um, review is not a good thing. Thank you. So with that, I will close the public hearing. And I'll ask if the applicant is present and they want to make a presentation, they're welcome to. Yeah, the applicant would be staff. Oh, yeah. yes, you're right. Thank you. You're present. Would you like to make a, a yeah, I'll, I'll speak briefly on the item just to clarify what's before the commission today. Um, it's an update to Title 21 of the, of the Municipal Code, which is the Environmental Review Pro uh, Ordinance to remove the process for the City Council to have a reconsideration of their decision on a final environmental impact report. Um, to explain what reconsideration is in the simplest way possible, uh, where the City Council is the initial decision-making body on a EIR, there's no higher body within the city to appeal it to. So a few years ago, the ordinance was updated to create a process where I, whereby someone who doesn't agree with the decision would essentially appeal the project back to the city council to reconsider their decision. The interested party would have three days to appeal the decision and um, the the, or excuse me, request reconsideration. And the reconsideration request is limited to offering new evidence um, or evidence and facts that the city council failed to provide a fair hearing or that they abused their discretion. We have found that um, we are the only municipality in California that has such a process that we've been able to find. It's not required under CEQA. And given that it only takes, you know, the, someone has three days to supposedly come up with brand new arguments, it hasn't been effective. Um, we've had two applications that had the reconsideration process filed on them. And in both cases, the appellant actually um, filed the same information that they had initially provided to the city council. So in the effort to streamline our environmental review and our development permit ordinance, we are recommending that the planning commission recommend that the city council amend title 21 to remove the reconsideration process. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from commissioners? We have two, so Commissioner Leba. Yeah, so of those two, cases that were requested for reconsideration, did the party requesting reconsideration eventually just take legal action anyway? Do you know? Good afternoon, members of the Planning Commission. David Keon, Principal Planner of Environmental Review. So the two cases where this and reconsideration was filed were both the same individual um, up in the Albizo area. Um, they were the Microsoft Data Center 237 industrial project, um, which went through the full CEQA process, um, yeah, our preparation, public hearing before planning commission and a public hearing before the city council. Um, the EIR was adopted and an individual filed for reconsideration of the EIR with the exact same letter, essentially that they had submitted previously and the city had already responded to. So in the second instance, there was just down the street at the America Center um, project, there was additional office building and EIR was re prepared, went through the CEQA process, again, full public review, disclosure, response to comments as required by CEQA, planning commission hearing, um, and city council hearing adopted the EIR. Um, basically a one page letter was submitted to do reconsideration with the exact same information that was submitted previously. Um, no new information. It was essentially you being used as a delay tactic since no new information is provided um, to go back to City Council and in both cases City Council upheld their adoption of the EIR. Okay. And in both cases they, the appellant did file a lawsuit. Okay. So there's nothing about removal of this reconsideration process that would limit anybody's ability to file suit provided they've brought um, a fair argument under CEQA. Correct. Okay. It's essentially one less step before they could, they file the lawsuit. Okay, but it removes a redundancy in the city process. Correct. Sounds good to me. Thank you. Commissioner Allen. And my only question is really quick as far as the initiation for the, uh, the policy change. Was it initiated by council or is this something staff took up as a result of the change in the state law and you're bringing it to council as a recommendation or is this something they requested? It was a streamlining effort staff identified. Okay, thanks. Uh, Madam Chair, I will also move approval if uh, that's appropriate at this time. All right. Second. There's a motion and a second by Commissioner Allen and Commissioner Leba. And also, for the record, I wanted to note that Commissioner Oliverio has arrived. So, with that, um, if there's no other questions or discussion on the item, I will go ahead and ask for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
All right, motion passes. Okay, then moving on to uh, number five, public hearing. And I'll read what's written here. Generally, the public hearing items are considered by the Planning Commission in the order in which they appear on the agenda. However, please be advised that the Commission may take items out of order, which doesn't apply tonight since we only have one item under public hearing um, to facilitate the agenda, such as to accommodate significant public testimony or may defer discussion of items to later agendas for public hearing uh, time management purposes. We do have many, many uh, speaker cards here. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, for a staff report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the item 5A is the appeal of the director's determination to approve a site development permit to demolish an existing single family house and commercial building, allow the construction of an approximately 5,650 square foot retail building, and allow the removal of three ordinance sized trees, ranging from approximately 38 to 56 inches in circumference. On an approximately 0.38 gross acre site located on the southeast corner of Ray Street and Garland Avenue. The proposed project is located on the southeast corner of Ray Street and Garland Avenue. A portion of the site is currently occupied by Middlebrook Gardens. The site is surrounded by commercial uses to the north and west and a church to the east and south. The project was reviewed for conformance with the Commercial Pedestrian Zoning District and the Neighborhood, commercial, neighborhood Community Commercial General Plan Land Use Designation. The proposed project meets the height limitations, setbacks, and development standards set forth in the zoning ordinance. The project includes a 20% parking reduction. The project would provide 20 on-site parking spaces. The current commercial nursery and landscape company, Middlebrook Gardens, has been in operation since 2000. In 2010, there was an intent to redevelop the site. A site development permit for an approximately 5,900 square foot retail building was approved in 2010. The project was found to be exempt from environmental review under the provis provisions of section 15332. However, the site development permit expired on January 27, 2012 because no building permit was approved prior to the expiration date. A historic report was prepared for the existing single family house. The building was not found to be individually eligible for listing in the California Register of Historical Resources or National Register of Historic Places. It was also not found to be eligible as a city landmark and was not considered to be a historic resource for the purposes of CEQA review. Staff acknowledges comments about the loss of the garden how, while staff acknowledges these concerns and heartfelt comments, staff must review the project in conformance to the city's general plan, city policies, and findings. The proposed project is a commercial project that is consistent with a neighborhood community commercial land, general plan land use designation and the development standards of the commercial pedestrian zoning district. Staff would, f would further emphasize our understanding uh, understanding of the concerns in the appeal letter in regards to climate change, the appellant's visionary goals in regards to education and furthering the focus on native gardening and techniques, which is consistent with various goals and the long-term vision for the city. The department has to be consistent in our evaluation of private development proposal and they're consistent with the adopted land use and zoning standards. Therefore, staff recommends that the planning commission consider the exemption in accordance with CEQA, deny the appeal and uphold the director's approval of the site development permit as described above and analyzed in the resolution and staff report. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation from staff. And at this point, I wanted to invite the applicant down to make a presentation. Um, appellate first, actually. Appellate first. Appellate right. first, and then the applicant, since this is an appeal. Okay, great. Um, would the appellant like to come down? And they have five minutes. Uh, the, would the appellant like to come down and speak for five minutes?
Thank you, Planning Commissioner members. And thanks to all of our supporters and people in the community. Can you be we, sure to speak into the microphone? Folks are having a hard time hearing you. Did, Thank you. All right, should I start again? <laughs> Thank you all planning commissioners and thanks to all the members of the community who came out to support uh, our work in the community for almost 20 years now. I have five minutes. <laughs> you have to cut me off. <laughs> in order for us as humans, all of us, to continue to live on this planet, we must restore and protect our local ecosystems in cities, in cities, where more than half of the people in the world live. If we don't do that, if our children don't see what the California systems, the California ecosystems look like, when they grow up, they won't protect them. 20 years ago, we took a broken concrete parking lot full of weeds and began to restore the oak woodlands and the grassland ecosystems that you see today when you visit the Middlebrook Center. We're asking the Planning Commission to postpone your decision tonight because Mr. Sultan's ad, the landlord, and I, the tenant, are required by the Superior Court of Santa Clara County to participate in a mediation process. This process will allow us to find a solution to Mr. Sultan's ad's compensation, as well as a solution for us to save the gardens. In the meantime, we are working on a larger proposal for the San Jose Center for Urban Sustainability. I have sent videos made by college interns in landscape architecture from UC Davis and San Jose State as an environmental studies major, recently graduated, and they will present those next. Our proposal would continue the work that we're doing in the community, but would do so much more. It would launch Silicon Valley the city of San Jose, the county of Santa Clara, as global leaders and partners in climate crisis solutions. And Mr. Sultan's ad would be fairly compensated for his property. We need more time. We need time to go through what the Superior Court has mandated that we go through. So I'm, I'm just asking for a postponement. Thank you. Thank you. And oh, okay. So uh, we all really appreciate your enthusiasm. However, I would respectfully request that you um, keep it inside, hold it inside, because we want to make sure everybody who comes down here feels welcome. Um, and for example, if someone were to be booed or um, clapped, it may feel, make people feel like they're a little scared to get up to the mic. So if you could just keep your emotions subdued, that would be wonderful. Um, so we have a question for the appellant from one of our commissioners. So if you could come back down to the mic, that would be fantastic. And do any of the other commissioners have a question for the appellant? Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Go ahead, Commissioner Yesney. Thank you. Um, why are you in court? The, the Superior Court is telling you you have to meet with the landlord? Uh, he has filed eviction. I see. Thank you. Commissioner Griswold? Um, so I actually also had a, a sort of question related to the request for more time. Mm -hmm. and um, why a decision one way or another here would affect your ability to mediate and come to some sort of resolution with the landlord. Well, I, when you see the presentation that we have, um, we've been talking to uh, major institutions to look at a larger center that would actually begin to educate our youth on how to resolve the climate crisis 
in terms of urban land use. And so those institutions are the County of Santa Clara, uh, Catholic Charities, um, the San Jose um, City College, and also our neighbor, um, the parish and the school of St. Leo's. Most of the land in the block is actually owned by the bishop. And so we are already starting to put a deal together. But I guess back to the original question, why does the decision here make any difference in terms of your ability to negotiate with the landlord irrespective of whether there is a planning approval or not? Uh, I think that uh, if you postpone the decision that within a very short time we are going to be able to find a solution to compensate Fred. And it would, it may, would be, it makes it very difficult for me, uh, you know, with this eviction, for me to carry on and do the work that we need to do to actually compensate Fred. But that's what I'm interested in doing. I'm interested in compensating Fred fair market value for what he, for his property. But I guess, is the fair market value going to change depending on our decision? Because if you're intending to compensate, why couldn't you compensate him irrespective of I'm whatever decision I'm not able to do that. It's going to take major institutional partners to do this. You know, we're, you know, even as we are now with 0.3 acres, we are working with, you know, San Jose City College. Uh, we're working with, um, uh, the diocese. We've been working with the schools. Uh, I serve on the um, care for uh, stewards of our common home uh, committee that advises the bishop on how he can have more uh, environmental um, programs while he is the new bishop. So uh, I've been working for the last year to bring the attention of the community to, you know, the, the crisis that we have here, uh, not just here, but globally, and um, in terms of climate crisis. And really, it's how you're going to solve it. You really need to solve it by educating our youth on land use, on urban agriculture, regenerative organic agriculture, actually is the solution for our problem with agriculture. Um, recently, in May 15th, um, on May 15th, um, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Agency uh, stated um, that we have 60 harvests left with the way we're growing food. And I have been perfecting this regenerative organic agriculture farming system. We have a farm. I was consultant to the Agrihood in Santa Clara. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's a low income, um, low income housing and it will have a Madam working. Chair. Yeah, can I, can I ask Commissioner Griswold, do you feel like you had your question answered? Yes, I feel like the, the answer now is straying beyond what I asked. Um, I did have one additional question, which is in looking at the, um, at the history of the site, it appears that there was a, um, a site development permit that was issued back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And so what happened at that point um, in terms of your tenancy and the attempts to potentially find a more permanent site, sort of given, I guess, the longstanding knowledge that the owner might develop the building? Well, Fred and I had a, a, we've had a good working relationship, pretty good over the last 20 years. And I've, we've, I've always been convinced because I'm a professional ecological designer and I build these farms in Africa and whatever, you don't want to hear about that. Uh, but um, I felt that what we were doing there by restoring nature in the city was really valuable for the youth that come to our camp and that we have been doing something there that really should be studied and duplicated in cities all over the world because the only way we're gonna live on the planet is if we restore our ecosystems. And so as time went on, 
that, that project was approved in 2010. Well, there's a lot that's happened in terms of climate change and, and in land use issues since then. And I don't believe that that particular use of the property is really addressing, you know, this is a very pedestrian neighborhood now. There are so many more people that are walking. There are so many more people that are taking public transit. And I think the way that, that you've put more parking there, uh, you going, know, I talked. Going back to my, I just want to stop you because I, I, you know, it seems like you're sort of veering beyond what I'm asking. I'm asking back in 2008 through 2010 when it was a potential for redevelopment, a, a, you know, on the table potential, were things explored in terms of moving the garden somewhere else? Because if we delay our decision for the potential of a partnership, I have to wonder why wasn't a partnership explored in 2008 or 2010? Well, I don't think it was clear to me that that was approved. You know, I, I, I don't ever uh, recall knowing that that was approved. I thought, I appeared before the Planning Commission at that time, uh, and we were going for a designation uh, that it, we're the only designated property in San Jose, and we're designated for having 200 benchmarks for sustainable urban land use. And that's a designation by the United States Green Building Council and the Sustainable Sites Initiative. And the Planning Commission that I talked to, they seemed to think that that was a very good reason for us not to leave there. Did you, Vice Chair Leiter, Yeah, I had did you? a couple questions. So, um, the, just following on this issue of entitlement from 2008 to 2010. So in our staff report, it said on January 27th, 2010, the Planning Commission denied the appeal and approved the site development permit. Is that, that's correct in the record? Okay. So on, on the site itself, are you tenants on both 76 Ray Street no. and 80 Ray Street? No. So just the... We're tenants on uh, not the house just the land around the house and the existing building that's on it's in 76. the back side yeah 76 Ray to, Street right and Andrews. I had reached out to Fred as uh, earlier as like last year and I said why don't you develop the old house as a restaurant and then the gardens could stay and he actually entertained it a little bit but then he got impatient and ended up you know getting a section 8 tenant in there and so um, then he just kept raising the rent this year. The rent went, you know, way sky high. Okay. Because of Google coming in. And I've also been talking to Google. I talked to Google for five months, and they were really interested in this because Google's campus is going to be, um, you know, all native gardens. They're only going to be 1,500 feet from us. And, you know, we envision this being a larger center for environmental education and sustainability and training of our youth. And I think things have changed since you first approved this. I think we are in a climate crisis. I think we are in an agricultural crisis. If you believe the United Nations, they did say that there are 60 harvests left. So I'm going to interrupt you. I, I, think, it's, I think it's safe to say that most people up here absolutely believe in climate change and are on board. I'm, I'm speaking. And are uh, worried about it. Yes. And are worried about it. So, so I don't know that you need to convince us that it's a problem. Um, and I, I also want to just say for commissioners who are asking questions, um, I don't want to necessarily interrupt you if, if you feel like your question hasn't been answered, but you know, feel free to interject. So, uh, Vice Chair Leiva, did you have more? We could potentially ask further questions of the applicant. Later in the hearing, okay. Then I yield. Or the both of applicant and the appellant. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. We have. Oh, I want to say that. Oh, hold on uh, one sec. We have a we have a question from okay. one of our commissioners. Hi, good evening. Hi. Yeah. Uh, do you have any letters of intent from these? Uh, you mentioned the County of Santa Clara, San Jose City College, Catholic Charities. Are there any? Do you have any documentation tonight? 
We that, have. I'm sorry. Do you have any documentation with you tonight that talks about, hey, we, we're, 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 we're interested, we're, we want to do something? I have an email from Chancellor Breland that I received this afternoon that does say, how can we form a partnership? Yes. And, and that's from San Jose City College? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to uh, say that uh, following and my... No, we're, we're out of time at this no, point. But so, the, the no, I'm videos, sorry. I, I just wanted to introduce the next three people are going to submit. They're going we to have, relinquish We have a contract. process for doing that, so thank you. Oh, they told me to do it. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, looks like maybe there was some um, miscommunication. Um, so it, if she didn't use all of her five minutes and she wanted to yield some of the times of the video, she could have done that earlier. But it seems we moved along from that part to questioning. So those people can still come up and present the video later. But I think the next process is now give the applicant an opportunity to present theirs and then public comments. Right. Great. Okay. So at this point, I want to invite the applicant down and the applicant as well has five minutes. Hello, everybody. My name is Brad Soltanzad. My family owns this property for the last 20 years. Aldri has been a tenant, a good tenant, but last time we applied for this project, it was 2008, 2010 approved, and she was appealing the same process, the same thing at that time, the same meetings. We had it at 2010, and she knows exactly that it was approved. Then she asked me to not to build it, give her time, a little bit of time. I said, okay, I give you one year. Then one year passed, another year, no. Another year, no, until expired. And I had some financial difficulty too, then I could not build that. I could have done it, but I gave her a lot of time to do that. And now she's, uh, she's been just telling me these things all the time for the last 20 years. I'm going to buy the property. I'm going to buy the property. Every month, I shouldn't say these things yet, but every month I have to go to that place, beg them for the rent. As of today, she owes me $62,000 for back rent. That's why I... Gave her three notice, three day notice. I gave her the eviction. The superior court is gonna evict her. I have to do with what I have to do with my property. I cannot depend on anybody else. My property is my property. She's she just come and pay the rent. I have to do this too. This time, we have done everything according to the city regulation, zoning, height, all the questions and all the requirement is approved. And the first time is approved. Now it's costed me $11,000 for this meeting to come in here and she is not paying any rent. What should I do? She's gonna be out. Just clear, she's gonna be out. I need approval for this project and I appreciate your time. Sorry that I'm emotion. I'm really sorry about that, but I have to do what's right for my family. And what's, I have children, I have future, I'm getting old, I have to take care of them. I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any questions oh, from my fellow commissioners? Sorry about that. And by the way, I have no commitment to her. She is a month-to-month -month tenant. No lease in place. No lease. She, the lease expired 17 years ago. Thank you. And I just worked with her. Just gave her too much time. So can the commissioners raise their hands if they want to speak or, you know, wink at me or something? So, Commissioner Yezny. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my question is relatively simple. Would you accept an amendment to your permit to revise some of the vegetation in the landscape plan to native species? Definitely. I understand this isn't the same thing as what there's now, but this is a movement we're trying to encourage. Whatever you say that I have to do to get on my project <laughs> and go ahead and do whatever is right to do, I, I, okay, I staff comply Okay, staff understands that. what's requested there. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And Commissioner Oliverio. Good evening. You had an entitlement granted by the city. Yes. You had meet, met every legal requirement and yes. gone through the appeal process, et cetera. Yes. You let it expire. Yes. And if I, if I understand from your comments, you let it expire because you had economic difficulties to go forward with the development, is that correct? Uh, at the same time that the plan was uh, approved by the board, yes, I could have built it, okay? But she was just begging me like every day Please wait for me. I'm talking to Google. I'm talking to City College. I'm talking to church. I'm talking. Time goes by, and my situation wasn't right in two years later. That's why I could not build it. Otherwise, right away after the, after the approval, I could have done it. It was Cor nice of me to give her a lot of time. Uh, so just to understand, uh, did, were you aware that the entitlement could expire? Yes, I was. And uh, so, it, so you made a deliberate choice to, uh, I mean, and so at that point when you knew the entitlement was expiring, yes, and you were having this discussion, what, what was the decision point when you just, because I believe staff, isn't there the opportunity to file something when you have an entitlement if you can't go forward or do you have to pull building permit, please? This is my first time building. Yeah, I know, and, and, and trust um, me, you're one of the few people that comes to us without a lobbyist, because okay. planning, no offense to my uh, professional planning staff, but I appreciate uh, it. it's sometimes a difficult process mm -hmm. for the average yes, person, yes. and it's, I'm actually shocked that you don't have a lobbyist, because I'd say most of the time that's what I see. Yeah. So if staff could let me know, though, is there a, if in, when you're in this situation, do you have the option of filing an extension or something like that? You're yeah. allowed up to two one-year extensions uh, to extend the expiration date of the permit. Um, that's usually up to the applicant um, to keep track of the expiration date. <clears throat> we also mail them a copy of the permits and the resolution that says their expiration date. And, but uh, staff does not say, hey, your, uh, your entitlement is expiring in 90 days. Unfortunately, we don't do that. And, um, and is this, would you say this is, happens often or rare? Uh, it's a lot of the times the market cycles kind of determine that um, we we have some projects that just disappear and never come back and those projects that are in considered inactive and not valid permits anymore we do have applicants that do extend the permits in terms of that um, so unfortunately staff doesn't go out to follow a lot of times the applicant land order them has changed over time as well um, so it's really on the owners of the owners and the applicants to follow up if they want an extension thank you very much and I'm sorry sir you've owned the property for 20 years 30 years how long have you owned yes this? Yes. I'm sorry, which one? <laughs> how, how long have you owned the property? 20 years. 20 years, yes. okay. All right, um, thank you. Sure, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Vice Chair? Uh, com <laughs> Vice Chair Leba. Commissioner Vice Chair Leba. Commissioner Vice Chair, wow, that's rather complicated. <laughs> I'm all about streamlining. Um, so <laughs> in terms of the, the development on the site there, yes. um, I, I was, just curious if you could share why that particular configuration, you know, one story office building, like why that product and not perhaps something else, um, given that, you know, everybody in San Jose is in a foam about That's housing a good shortage. Question. Yeah. Uh, I had some investor uh, approaching me and they wanted to have, uh, they were telling me to go underground parking and some uh, uh, commercial downstairs and residential upstairs. I said, it's gonna cost a lot of money for that. I'm not doing that. I cannot afford doing it because I'm just doing this for my kids. And uh, that's why I did not wanna pursue other- So it's about the capital investment right, and exactly. feasibility. Okay, but, understood. You know, probably the best use would be that but it doesn't work for me. Yeah. All right, thank you. Sure. Any other questions from commissioners? Seeing none, thank you so much. Sure, thank you.
Thank you for your time. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, there are many, many cards here, so I'm going to uh, be strict about keeping you all to two minutes. I'm going to ask again that you keep your emotions uh, subdued and in check so that we can make sure everybody feels safe coming down to the mic. It is uh, a scary thing to stand up here, um, regardless of what side you're on. And so we're going to go ahead and get started, unless staff has something to correct me on. Uh, all right, so we're going to start with Melinda. I only have a first name. It just says Melinda. Madam Chair, if we could, could you call off a couple of names so they Sure, can... yes, thank you for reminding me. So I'm going to go ahead and call three, and if you could make your way down close to the podium so that we can keep things moving fairly quickly. So Melinda, John Paul Snaff, or Snall, Small, and then Judy Broughton. Can I start whenever? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Melinda. I interned with Middlebrook Gardens and the California Native Garden Foundation in 2017. And I just want to share a little bit about my experience. I feel that the Middlebrook Gardens and California Native Garden Foundation are an incredible asset to the local community because it provides so many valuable learning opportunities for students in the South Bay as well as the East Bay. I myself am not a resident of San Jose, however, I found that Middlebrook Gardens and California Native Garden Foundation provides opportunities that I didn't find where I'm from in the East Bay. During my summer interning with Aori, I got to learn about regenerative agriculture, hydroponics, stormwater management, carbon farming, and a lot more. And we had field trips to lead to see leaders of these systems doing their craft in action, including Oroboros, aquaponics, and um, seeing frogs farm. In addition, I got to present um, alongside other interns in Aori um, to the U.S. Representative Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren and City of Santa Clara Mayor Lisa Gilmore, as well as the San Jose State University um, to share with them the eco-village eco model we had been working on. I feel that in my time at Middlebrook Gardens, I was able to learn core concepts that I feel are crucial to understand how we should evaluate our current land use practices. And I feel that the, um, the current programs bring a lot of value to the community, providing environmental education for young, ch young children through college students. Thank you. Thank you. With nine seconds to spare, thank you very much. So I want to go ahead and call up John Paul Snap. 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 Yes. Oh, those are peas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my wife, Heather Daniel, and I own our home at 1036 Garland. That makes us the very closest San Jose residents to this proposed development. We moved here from Portland, Oregon, a verdant city known for its green spaces and focus on st sustainability. We were thrilled to find a home next to one of, if not the only, private green space in central San Jose. Several months ago, we were dismayed to find that a progressive, community-focused, educational space was going to be destroyed in order to build another nondescript strip center and parking lot. Already, there are numerous abandoned developments on Race Street. Our neighborhood would be much better served by having one of these existing developments refurbished and reopened rather than having a lovely green space eliminated. In addition, the addition of this of development is almost certain to increase traffic on our narrow residential streets. Already, there is no parking allowed on Garland Avenue due to the narrow nature of the street. Already, Garland Avenue and the surrounding streets are used as a cut through by motorists seeking to avoid traffic on the Alameda, Ray Street, and Park Avenue. Dozens of children and families attend school or church at St. Leo's Parish and will be affected by this traffic. Neighborhood and parish children use these streets. They need streets that are safe. I would ask this commission to have the courage to say no to a soulless commercial development and yes to the existing space that benefits both the community and the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to call up Judy Broughton, and then if Jennifer Jigor and Barry Slater and Lisa Paolo could make their way down. 
Good Sorry. evening. Okay, um, I think most people have said what I feel inside my heart, so I'm going to keep it even shorter than your two minutes. You can hold me to that. Okay, I think Middlebrook is a wonderful place because it teaches the importance of pollinators, etc., to children and adults. And I may say the children are a lot smarter than us nowadays. Um, I think we should keep it in some way or another. I think San Jose should find a way to keep it. Some way. There is always a way. Because teaching future generations how to look after and sustain such a healthy environment, what plants to grow, what improves the local native species, how we can improve the soil. I see children doing that all there all the time, and I think it's wonderful. And um, obviously, I'm from the UK. We have many gardens there. We are passionate about our gardens and our parks. I would love to see San Jose, and I challenge them to really rise to this occasion and keep this space, find a way to do it, and improve on it, and find other places like this place and improve on them too because you have such an opportunity with what you already have. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Jigor. My name is Jennifer Jigor. I am an artist and the professional development chair of the board of directors to the NCWCA. That is the Northern Californian Women's Caucus for Arts. The Eiffel Tower of Paris originally was disliked by the French. It was to be destroyed 20 years after it was built. Today, it is a beloved landmark that guarantees creative inspiration and revenue for the city. Dear San Jose, where are our beloved landmarks? We are more than techno corporations and traffic jams. San Jose used to be known as the Valley of the Heart's Delight. What is delightful about concrete and cookie cutter strip malls that look like any other city? Who from Paris would fly all the way to San Jose to visit Panera on Race Street? San Jose is not Paris, not today, but it could be tomorrow. As an artist with a vision for, of the future for all of us, I see grand things coming from Middlebrook Gardens. There is already beautiful artwork in place at Middlebrook that must be saved. Someone from Paris may want to see it in the future. Like the Eiffel Tower, Middlebrook is now in limbo of being destroyed after almost 20 years. In the beginning, the people of France had no idea the Eiffel Tower would bring them a golden future. Where does gold come from? Gold, golden things come from the ground. It is part of Mother Earth. San Jose, you already have gold in Middlebrook Gardens. As an artist and board of director of the NCWCA, I bring a promise of a golden future in collaboration with Middlebrook Gardens. Save the garden and you will see artistic creations in art and nature that will bring the world to us. This is a golden opportunity. Let's take back our title as the Valley of the Heart's Delight again. Our golden future with Middlebrook Gardens starts now. Thank you. Thank you very Chair, much. May I ask a question of the yep. uh, speaker? Hi, does, is the collaboration and support, is any of that financial or is it purely working with them on your initiatives that you have? That's a very good question. Um, I am late in the game to this. I didn't know about what was going to happen to Middlebrook Gardens um, late. If had I known about this months ago, I would have uh, planned in advance to have a certain amount of people to help with um, finances and funding. Um, right now, uh, I will honestly say that that is possible. It does, is, and does your, uh, did you, does, what's the annual budget for your group? Uh, the annual budget, well, that's, that's an excellent question and I wish I brought you the exact figures, but that's something that I can um, hand to you later if you like. Um, but if to answer your question, right now there is no um, monetized agreement, but that is not to say that there could be in the future. But the acronym you said for your organization, yes. if, if you could state it one more time. Sure, it's Northern Californian Women's Caucus for the Arts. Okay, I just want to search for it on the web. Maybe sure. I can see what the annual budget is, just to put things in proportion, right? If it, you know, sure. if, it, if you're a hundred million dollar organization versus uh, a half yeah, a million. Yeah, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah. so let me make the, this clear. It would be something that, okay, so the artists of this organization, we are um, artists, but we're also activists. So we go out and we help 
artists such as Ulrey and around the Bay Area. And um, we find ways in which we can reach out to other people who do have the money to come and help. Okay, I'll look at it on the web. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. All right, Barry Slater. My name is Barry Slater and I've been a family physician in San Jose for the past 45 years. I'm still practicing, uh, trying to get it right. Over my career, I have been witness to many medical w miracles, <clears throat> but I wonder sometimes if we've truly made our patients healthier. We have more diabetes, obesity, anxiety, and depression. What we don't have is a clear message from our leaders about the role of alienation from the natural world as a cause for disease. Our cities are like our bodies. They have skin, it's called soil. If you abrade it, denude it, poison it, suffocate it with asphalt, you can drive cars, but you can't grow plants. If soil is our skin, then plants are our lungs. Native trees, bushes, grasslands took a few million years to produce the exact amount of oxygen <clears throat> and absorb the excessive carbon dioxide. If there's no arable land, then there will be no trees. So what has this to do with 76 Ray Street? This piece of land is one of the last bastions where children and adults get to dig their hands into rich, fertile earth, eat a warm vegetable fre freshly picked, learn about the intricacies of the reality we call nature. It teaches them to honor and protect the land. I'm not a lawyer or a politician or even a particularly good businessman but I know something about health, and the health of this city and the people who live here are tied to the decision you make tonight. It seems such a small place, but there is none like it, and if it goes under, it will not be replaced. My prescription as a doctor who's been around a while is to stay out of the doctor's office as much as possible and spend time in nature. 76 Ray Street would be a good beginning. Thank you very much. Next, I'm going to ask you not to clap. Thank you very much. Appreciate the enthusiasm, but please uh, hold back. Um, so Lisa Paolo is next, and I'm going to call up the next few folks as well. Michael Maker, Sanita Dada, and Valerie Ekrit. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic. My name is Lisa Paolo. My daughter is a San Jose State student, and she volunteers at the Middlebrook Garden at 76 Ray Street. Through her, I have learned about the benefits the garden has provided to the local community, such as educational programs designed to teach children and adults about environmentally sustainable farming, such as regenerative farming, hydrophonics, composting, and native landscaping. In my job, focused at the state level at, on clean energy workforce development, I have learned about the importance of teaching children as young as kindergarten to think about what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, this, uh, like for example, instead of saying, I want to be a race car driver or a beauty queen, if you realistically teach children as young as kindergarten, they will come up with other more realistic careers, such as sustainable farmer or native landscapist. This is all uh, documented in scholarly journals and child development agencies are very aware of this. Um, one document I'll call your attention to is called The Early Years, Career Development for Young Children by Cahill and Furre, if you're really interested. So this, uh, preserving this valuable educational local community garden and farms, which are increasingly rare, especially in the cities, uh, due to climate, to, due to a climate of overdevelopment and valuation of financial revenues over other more valuable community resources. For these reasons, it is important to support an extension and mediation for careful consideration of the potential negative impact on this community, which will result from destroying this valuable community resource, which has existed for over 20 years. Thank Those you so much, your time is up. Thank you, that was the last point. <laughs> Good timing. Michael Maker. <laughs> Thank you, members of the Planning Committee, for letting us speak. I'm Michael Maker. 
I'm here today in support of the appeal in favor of the garden. As a student of San Jose City College, I started volunteering at the garden through one of my professors. And since then, I've gotten to see the community value, the ecosystem, the plant life, the animal life, everything that it brings, as well as agriculture going to the local markets. I've gotten to work alongside high schoolers, other college students, college graduates, and it's really shown me the value of the work that we're doing there. Uh, I'm in favor of capitalism and land ownership, and I understand it's a really hard decision and feel for all sides. There's no easy decision in this. Um, but I just think that this project, it takes out an entire ecosystem and we can't devalue that. And <laughs> San Jose has resources. We have camaraderie. We have good community. And giving this more time could allow us to come up with ways that would do something more than just putting up a retail building. Uh, essentially, we're valuing money here. We're not going for the low-hanging fruit. We have single-family homes that don't represent entire ecosystems that developers would love the opportunity to put the building up on, but instead, we're going to go for a property like this and put up a parking lot. Uh, that's not even a good way to solve a problem like the lack of housing that we have in San Jose. So it's not even a good solution to a problem, and it's taken away uh, a very scarce ecosystem that we don't have a lot of. So as a local student here, I hope that I can see some way in the future that we can postpone this or change what's being done to it in a way that is more congruent with these values. You guys all believe in climate change. We know that you're on the right side there. So we just hope that things can be more congruent with what we're going forward with. And thank you. Thank you very much. Sunita. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak, uh, to give me this opportunity to speak. I am Sanhita Data. I am uh, an environmental science professor in San Jose City College, and I, I have a very rewarding job because I have students like Michael who just spoke. Um, so um, I met Alri only a month and a half ago, and I've been to that garden many times, and what I can say is that about 70% of my curriculum overlaps with that garden, and I see a huge opportunity uh, to involve my students there, uh, who in San Jose City College are often come from low-income households and uh, with very little exposure to natural places, and they can get hands-on work on a regular basis in a place that is really unique. It is, I understand what you were saying with about planting natural vegetation and native plants and all that but what we have here is an urban agriculture it is not the same as growing crops on big plots of land it is a very different skill set which actually has been uh, done really well here so that is something that I cannot find uh, in other places um, just before coming here I heard from the Chancellor uh, of um, uh, Evergreen Community College District, and he's interested in talking about this. He's also very interested in developing low-income housing for some of our students. Um, so I haven't had a chance to talk to him. I saw his email just before coming here. Like I said, I just met Alri a month and a half ago, and I've been kind of wrapping my brain around this. But I have been very impressed with what's there, and um, I always look for places to take my students on a regular basis for hands-on activity that will really get the concepts, and this is one of the very few places which I'll actually do that. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. No, and Chair, uh, this email has been referenced uh, twice. Could we get a copy of that? If it's only electronic, could someone send it to someone at the, at the pl planning staff? If you let me know who to send it to, I can forward it. Is there a generic email that we can recommend someone to send that to? He'll, they'll tell you on the side there. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, oh, Valerie Ekrit. Hi. I live and work in San Jose, uh, both within walking distance of the garden. One Saturday at the farmer's market, I met Alri. I'd been looking for a sustainable community and was thrilled to discover such a place within walking distance at 76 Race. This is the place that grows my lunch some days. It's where I throw my food scraps away. It's where children love to run around and find alligator lizards on the ground. We need you to keep Middlebrook alive and get 25 other gardens 
to thrive. If we use our collective power, this garden can continue to flower. My understanding of the Planning Commission is that it is appellate body of the City Council and makes land use decisions. It doesn't seem to me that these decisions are made based on the sustainability goals that the city has or any other of the city's goals. The agenda shows the commission plans to uphold the decision to approve the development of the mini mall based on whether or not it conforms to the city's existing rules, plans, and zones as opposed to goals. If uh, I'd like to ask all commissioners to bring to mind why you wanted a spot in this group and if it has anything to do with serving the people of San Jose, I would uh, ask you all to use the courage that you have while voting on this measure and consider which decision would be most beneficial for the people of San Jose and their future. I highly recommend you grant the appeal or at a minimum postpone the decision to allow Middlebrook Gardens to work out a long-term solution with the landlord, satisfying his desire to get financial value out of his property and securing the future of the gardens for all of us today and for future generations. I'd also like to mention that the money that Fred claims that Alry owes is above and beyond the payments that are outlined in their shared lease. Thank you. Thank you, and I was remiss at calling down the next set. So we have Maya Paulo, Diane Ha, and Christina O'Connor, if you could come down. Hello. The California Native Garden Foundation is an active learning space for the youth and community of San Jose. As a volunteer camp counselor at the Earth Heroes Nature Camp, I first-handedly see the joy and wonder the children experience when they try something new, such as harvesting or drying herbs, making lunch from fresh vegetables harvested at the garden, or even learning how to make toothpaste from plants, all while the children learn and retain the importance of native ecosystems and regenerative agriculture. As a public health student at San Jose State University, I have learned the importance of green spaces such as parks and gardens in the improvement of community members' mental health and attitudes as they are proven to help reduce stress in neighborhoods. Green spaces encourage connection and involvement between community members, which is essential in any urban city such as San Jose. City planners and officials should take into account the mental health and well-being of their citizens to help create a healthy community. The California Native Garden Foundation is quite special because it gives the citizens an opportunity to give back and be active in their community while sim simultaneously educating the public on the importance of native ecosystems in repairing our earth. Regenerative agriculture and urban farming are skills everybody should be learning from childhood, especially with the climate crisis our earth is facing today. This garden needs to stay and continue cultivating as an educational and hands-on resource for many generations to come. For these reasons, it is important that city officials grant more time for our nonprofit to find alternate methods of preserving this valuable resource. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Next up is Diane Ha, and then Christina O'Connor, and then Nancy Moreau. May I start? Hi. Hi. Good, good evening, members of the Planning Commission. I'm an intern at Middlebrook Garden and I would like to relinquish my time to present the concept video of the San Jose Center for Urban Sustainability. For urban sustainability, I'm gonna push in right now and this is the rooftop aquaponics garden and training center. Right next to it was the faculty and student housing. This is a St. Leo's and Great Church Parish. Above that, we have a restaurant of Eating California, which is a chef in residency program. Elsie, the teaching garden is really important. Those are the only ones existing today at the center right now. Quiet gathering space for residents. St. Leo's School and Gymnasium, solar panels on the roof of that building and wind panels. We have an outdoor teaching and classroom stage area. Adjacent to that, a demonstration garden a public gathering area, a barn and retail and food prep area, which is a great place to harvest the regenerative organic agriculture grown at this space. And next to that was the food forest and orchard. 
On top of this aquaponics farm is also the student and faculty housing, and both of those are parking structures as well. Oh, let me correct myself. That was the concept drawing and not the concept video of the program elements. Yeah, that's it. Right. Oh, yep. Oh. We have a question for you, Commissioner question. Griswold. I'm sorry. I was a little confused at what I was looking at on that um, on the diagram. Now it's no longer on the screen. But is the um, the the Center for Sustainability with the Leo School um, is that side of it um, separate from what we're looking at today? Was any was this was all of the what's depicted here in the site or it's the whole block? The whole block. Okay. So the the portion of the um, of the appeal that we're looking at today, it, is that, would that affect where you have the LC teaching gardens located? Um, well, this is just like a proposed, um, site for the whole block, including the garden and the site. But I'm also a little confused sometimes on. You have, um, is there any agreement with St. Leo's to, um, or, I'm not sure if St. Leo's occupies that entire area where you have the rooftop um, aquaponics and um, and the regenerative organic agriculture area, but is there any agreement with the landowners for those sites to put into place what you have proposed here? Um, we did talk with St. Leo's and they said that they um would like this design because it includes what they want in like early childhood development, playground, school. The church is going to stay where it is right now, and we're just um, adding more elements for the program and the children to have, like, um, the children to be more exposed to like the native gardens around there. So, and I'm not sure. Maybe you, this you're not the right person to ask. Yeah, but do you, do you know if there's a formal agreement? that um, would sign on to this particular design or the plans here? Um, I'm not, I don't think I could answer for that because I'm just also an intern and I just started last week too. But Oops. you could probably ask Al Allery. Well, thank you for presenting, I appreciate it. And Chair, just to follow up, thank you, Chair. Um, there's also various single family homes in that block that are, I assume, privately held. Yeah. So. Um, uh, you know, we have to have people's permission to plan things with their property. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. So, but, but thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, next up we have Christina O'Connor. You know, <clears throat> hi, thank you for letting me speak. Um, not to answer that question completely, but I think that that's the main point of the story is there's multiple chances for things to come together. And I think that that is one of the main things that is being requested in terms of the more time uh, for the chance for this to work itself out because there are opportunities and community um, there's support everything seems like it's starting to come together whether it's with you know our new partners with the uh, san jose city college or the archbishop or you know other streams of revenue that haven't been officialized yet um i have been volunteering there for over a year now and um you know i didn't get a speech together but you know tomorrow i'm going to be making elderberry syrup with kids and you know we're going to be doing native foods. You know, what she's created there, it has only been 20 years, and it's, it's all these little beautiful plant communities, like a little microcosm of California, whether it's desert, chaparral, mixed evergreen forest, oak woodland, coastal bluff, all these things that, you know, I never even knew about going into it as a native Californian and as someone that was born and raised in San Jose. Um, like I said, I didn't build a speech, but I just wanted to say that when I spoke to a Google employee that actually just came here from Brooklyn, she said this would never happen in Brooklyn. This would never get mowed down and turned into a strip mall. And it's like that whole, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. You know, don't, don't it always seem to go, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And um, my time's almost up, but I don't want us to do this and look back and go, oh, 
oh, I wish that didn't happen or I wish we did something to make that stop. And I think that's why everyone is here today is, you know, let's try to make this stop. Thank you. Next up is Nancy Murrow. My name is Nancy Murrow. I'm a student from um, San Jose State. I'm originally from San Diego. And when I moved to San Jose and through the classes, that's when I started learning about garden. So I'm here um, to talk about the importance of having garden, not just to save this one, but open more. I'm 37 until two years ago, I just to learn about what is campus, what is um, desert in the communities, desert food in the communities, the problem with the visit, I'm divided. When I was a kid, I never had the opportunity to go garden and learn about campus. I never learned about the like the good reason to returning all those food waste from more vegetables and put it back to their um to their to the earth until right now. So um, I feel that you see kids over here. So I have the opportunity that my parents, grandparents, pass me plants and pass me water, clean water, and I was able to see this blue sky and breathe clean air. And I feel like we're not doing nothing for the kids that are here. I think we're passing plastic to them. So this is important why we need to start teaching our kids from, um, from, from kids to learn the importance of all these things. And I understand the position of the owner of the place, but we, we, if we communicate, we can give to, 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 to plan something for the benefit of him and his family. So he have the economics and also to save places like this. Um, I'm not sure what else to say, but um, I, I feel I trust in you because I know when you got this position is you were looking for the benefit of the people. Thank you. I'm going to call down uh, April Chim, Chim, Allegra Watson, and Carita Hummer. I'd like to relinquish my time to Gavin. Okay. Um, Ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Gavin Rust. I'm 13 years old and go to Hoover Middle School in San Jose, California, located nearby. I'm here to talk to you about Middlebrook Gardens, where I actually am right now. This garden is very important, as you could tell by so many of the people that showed up. But what happens if it all goes to waste? Well, let's start off with the work we're doing. There aren't too many small half acre community gardens with roses and daisies that give thousands of dollars in grants to six schools in the San Jose Unified School District, helping them change the way we farm and the way that we change history. Also, not to forget the way that we are restoring our ecosystems. I mean, I'm currently in, it may not look like it where I am, but this is a grassland ecosystem that is completely restored. And we could have over 20 more of these, and this could help us solve climate change. Here's the thing. San Jose used to be the capital of the Valley of the Heart's Delight, specializing in native plants and being able to really have a hub for nature. And we had the Silicon Valley, which is also great for computers and attracting so many people from across the globe. But then we began to choose one, Silicon Valley. But when it comes to saving this garden, finding ways to solve climate change, while at the same time being able to help me, like myself as a child, at my school, what if we were able to bring the Valley of the Heart's Delight and the Silicon Valley together? Snap them together. My question for you, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission, do you want to be on the right side of history or the wrong side? The choice is yours. Do any commissioners have questions for Gavin? <laughs> All right. Next up is Allegra Watson and then Carita Hummer followed by Juliana Cheplik.
that um, the Middlebrook Garden Center is so much more valuable in terms of economic viability as well as planning sustainably in San Jose than the proposed retail development. The development is not considering the long-term or future conditions that humans will have to adapt to as our climate continues to change. And after reading the agenda that the Planning Commission provided, I realized that outdoor spaces like Middlebrook Gardens are very undervalued in our downtown area. The focus was mostly on the buildings that resided on 76 and 80 Ray Street rather than the entire property, which mostly includes the outdoor space and the native gardens that are there. And I definitely feel that the garden provides one of the only outdoor spaces in San Jose to learn about and connect with our native ecology, native edible plants, and agricultural foods, which none of the areas I know in San Jose do that. Um, it is an embodiment of the future of agriculture and sustainable living, and is a space for people of all ages to learn and benefit from being outdoors, experiencing native habitats and fresh food. Personally, the garden has inspired my career path in native habitat restoration when I was an intern and nature camp leader two years ago, and I continue to learn from the garden as a volunteer now. Giving back to my community and experiencing the kids playing and learning in the garden, garden is a priceless opportunity, and I hope the Planning Commission will do what they can to help Hallery and her nonprofit find a solution to buy the property from the current landowner and keep the gardens running. And I strongly hope you revise your planning focus to value the open space and sustainable land uses that will serve the community as a whole rather than the individual property developers who build structures rather than native open spaces and contribute to carbon emissions and climate change. Because our, our future depends on sustainable land use rather than, or, and the garden provides the open space hands-on experience and education necessary for the people of San Jose to create a viable future. Thank you. Thank you. Karita Hummer. Thank you so much, commissioners, for this opportunity. I'm Karita Hummer. I'm a resident of San Jose, live in downtown San Jose, and I've been an activist in San Jose for a long time. I've known Elry Middlebrook. I'm a co-founder of the Preservation of Action Council of San Jose, proud to say. And um, I knew Elry from way back when we were saving the uh, houses on River Street. And by the way, there is a historic house. In my opinion, it is a historic house. I hope it's been studied as such on that property. And it should be saved along with the garden for purposes that would benefit the garden and our city. Um, Elry Middlebrook actually uh, designed the Italian gardens down there in Little Italy, uh, there in uh, next to Guad Guadalupe Park. And it's quite a beautiful site. It's a landmark, and then she went on to really design her own landmark site. It's already a landmark for the city, and I think somebody mentioned the Eiffel Tower, and it is indeed uh, a landmark. I am uh, the founder and uh, clinical director and president of FACTOR, Family Alliance for Counseling Tools and Resolution. I do a lot of nonprofits, so that's my latest. And that is on, for the benefit of refugees and immigrants. And we are a partner at the California Native Garden Foundation at 76 Ray Street, where we have uh, a demonstration project called the Mindful Aging Project on behalf of elder immigrants and refugees. What uh, Elry has managed to do there is to build an eco-village for many purposes to serve both the those in greatest need, such as refugees and immigrants, and to educate our um, city and our area as a, the, for the whole region. It could be an absolute model project for the whole region and for Thank our state and would bring a great deal. Thank you, your time is up. Already up? Oh, yep. <laughs> I had more to say. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. All right, up next is Ju Juliana Cheplik, and then followed by Elizabeth Agreement and Miguel Lepatur. I am, I, I apologize for slaughtering people's names. 
Good evening, my name is Juliana. I'm an intern from UC Davis studying landscape architecture. And in my short time at the California Native Garden Foundation, I learned more about actually implementing and restoring urban landscapes than I have thus far in my education. And I'd like to uh, hand my time over to presenting the concept video. The San Jose Center for Urban Sustainability is a green campus first and foremost. The campus residents and their families have access to the following programs you are about to see. Inside the campus lies a regenerative farm and training program, so residents can learn to grow and harvest their own food from the farm and the orchard. Within the farm complex exists an aquaponics farm and training center. It also has an upcycled gray water system supplying the majority of residents water and a composting and vermicomposting area. The center boasts a farm to table restaurant and cafe with a rotating chef residency. So chefs from all over the world can come to San Jose and experience this sustainable oasis. The new Catholic school adjacent will also have an outdoor learning center, preschool and after school program so kids can learn the importance of soil ecology and nutrition that food plants provide along with a chicken coop for the children to harvest eggs from. The San Jose Center has a scooter and bike charging station, is wind and solar powered, has an outdoor community space and entertainment area along with a fitness area and a green track to get that perfect workout in. Thank you for hearing what this incredible space can become. Thank you. Next up is Elizabeth Agreement. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth Agrimo Justiniano, um, and I believe that it's extremely important to keep the Middlebrook Garden open in the community of San Jose. It's an integral part of the community. It is valued. Education in the environment is valued. Being in nature has a calming and peaceful effect on people. Hands-on interactive learning outside has a positive impact on children and older students and everyone. It's important to keep these spaces accessible because many people living in cities who are low income have difficulties accessing educational gardens, especially as the funding for public education continues to decrease. It's important that these resources remain free or low cost and accessible for everyone. Being in a garden has positive impacts on people's mental health. Please provide an extension. Please save San Jose, help secure additional funds to keep the California Native Garden open. And just after seeing that video, I'm super excited for what this could become. And I feel like this is something that would attract more people to the city of San Jose and make them want to get involved. And I think it's extremely important that we keep spaces like this and continue this educational process. Um, remembering the land that we are on is not our land, but the land of the Mwek Ohlone um, Native tribe. And being indigenous myself, being of Quechua descent um, from Bolivia, it's really important to be able to have access to these spaces. And also being just like black and Latino, I'm half black, half Latino, like raised in Oakland, I didn't really have access to this. And, um, or I saw it slowly disappear as funding and education decrease. So I think that it's extremely important to have these spaces for our future generations and for us now. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Miguel Lepouter, and I apologize. Um, after that is Alex Shore, Marita Grudzer, Grudzen, and Gustavo Fernandez. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so first thing I want to say is that... And could you state your name for the record? Miguel Lobut. Yeah. Uh, so first thing I want to say is that what Ari is doing and her family is really incredible. I'm 23, almost 23, and I cannot keep up with like her rhythm. It's incredible. Okay. So what she's doing to keep this place alive and really for the benefit of the community is... is I, 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 am, I am impressed. I still don't understand. But uh, now it starts my own thing. Uh, my dad used to say that when you grow up, you'll understand. When you grow up, you'll understand, you'll see. And I, the more I grow up, the more I understand. And the more I understand, the less I understand. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on, really? Uh, like, I understand that it's all about money. Yes, that's fine. Uh, but I also understand that we become really narrow-minded and greedy and uh, short-sighted when it's all about money. Um, and really, 
I'm sorry to say this, but of course, all Fred wants is money, and that's fine. Yes, it, his his property, of course. But uh, all what I know has happened is that rent has risen significantly and just go up and up and up. And what happens with that is that holistic development cannot happen because um, we want to build commercial, we want to build houses, that's good, okay. But if we don't have gardens, uh, there's absolutely, like the, the health of the city is, is, is nowhere. It's absolutely nowhere. And uh, it's really sad that this is happening. And uh, again, I, want, I really want to stress that with this rhythm and building parking lots, and building stores and building restaurants, the city is not going anywhere. Do you, and I don't know if you all see like where that leads. I, I don't see it actually, it's really great. Um, that said, uh, I, I know my time is up, but I did want to ask you if you have been to the place uh, in the recent years, and if you have. Your time is up, yep. yes, we've been you, there. I'm sure you understand why this is important. I, and I hope you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Alex Shore. Alex Shore. <laughs> Can't you hear me? Clean out your ears, boy. <laughs> I, I was trying uh, to be polite. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yes, take note. <laughs> Alex, I'm giving you a hard time. I noticed. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about, I, I live about six blocks from this site and I'm an advocate for walkable, livable, sustainable communities here in our city. I'm concerned that this usage that is proposed would not be in compliance with land use policy 5.3 which says to encourage new and intensification of existing commercial development, including standalone vertical mixed use or integrated horizontal mixed use projects consistent with the land use transportation diagram. This is part of the general plan. I don't see a single story building replacing a single story home as a quote intensification of land. That to me is what I would call a replacement of land use at the exact same height. I think an intensification would be a two-story building, say, 50, store, or 50 feet, which is what is allowed by the general plan on this site. 29 feet is not an intensification. It is a replacement of this site. And I think I, reading the planning report, the planning report talks a lot about, well, the buildings on this street, on Ray Street, are single story, so this is totally fine. Well, this is not the historical department, this is the planning department. And this city and this department and you all as a commissioner are planning for a future in which in dense urban areas like on Race Street, we are not going to just have single story buildings forever. If we approve this project here tonight as is, I worry that all of us will walk around this city and walk around this neighborhood and walk past this site for years to come and say what could have been. And I understand there are legal constraints, but there is a moral imperative to build a more sustainable city. And this project, with all due respect, does not achieve that. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Marita Grudzin, followed by Gustavo Fernandez, and then Tali Rosalini. Good evening. My name is Marita Grudzin. I am a resident and my family has been for 40 years here in San Jose. I also am Associate Director Emerita of the Stanford University Ethnogeriatric Project, where we studied ethnic elders, their world beliefs, their healing practices, and um, many other aspects of their understanding of disease, their seeking of disease. And I know firsthand from having trained many physicians, social workers, pastors, um, and uh, I know firsthand that there is a real gap between the ways that we practice Western 
uh, health and healing and the ways that ethnic minority elders do. And I have visited with the ethnic minority elders that come to Middlebrook Gardens. And it's amazing the level of ease, of comfort, of um, connection that they feel not only with the earth, but with one another. I wonder how many of you have visited the uh, LC Middlebrook Gardens. Could I see how many of you have actually been there, know what it looks like? I'm encouraged by that, that four of you have. And um, I have to tell you that, um, it, to me, uh, at this point in time, we all have been invited to live in this moment of time where we know that we have 11 and a half years before millions of insects and other species will be eliminated. We have to make choices that support health and the environment and sustainability. And I ask you to look at the big picture. Your time is up. As well as the, Thank the you. Uh, legal items that you're looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Gustavo Fernandez, followed by Tali Rosalini, and then Darian Lee. Hello, my name is Gus Fernandez. I am a neighbor of Min Middlebrook Gardens. Uh, on that map that you see there, we are right across the street from Ray Street there in that uh, directly to the left on the map on the squarish uh, property. Uh, we are very concerned, my wife and I are very concerned about the increased traffic and increased noise that will uh, occur if we uh, redevelop that space. Um, we already have a large problem already with noise with uh, local restaurants. Uh, there's two uh, Mexican restaurants and a lot of other establishments that are causing a lot of traffic in that area. We see a lot of homelessness. There is a bus shelter uh, around the corner from where we live when we regularly have to uh, ask uh, homeless people to, to leave and we've had to call the, uh, the police department on that many times. Uh, so we believe that this will have a, uh, this will add more noise and more traffic and more overflow even though there is a parking lot. I suspect that there will be more overflow parking. Furthermore, in, on, in support of Middlebrook Gardens, uh, we are actually a, uh, a customer of theirs. They actually did our uh, re-landscaping of our front lawn. And um, if you come to visit uh, Middlebrook Gardens, I also suggest that you take a look right across the street from them at our, at our um, lot at 1135 Yosemite, where they did an excellent job and, uh, last year when they built it, and we're very happy with their work. Thank you very much. Next up is Tali Rosalini. Hello, good evening. My name is Tali Lafi Rosalini. Uh, I am very uh, concerned about this situation in the sense that I believe that the um, garden uh, should be preserved because it is in the interest of uh, really teaching the world through the children, through the youth, about regenerative farming, which is, in fact, the way that we can avoid a calamity. We're in a um, threat to existence, existential threat, because of what's going on with climate change. And I believe that if you understand what is really happening, this, this community is blessed to have this garden here. I am from Seattle, and I've been living in California most of my the last 30 years, based in Santa Cruz. I'm the founder of African Family Film Foundation, an all-volunteer nonprofit, and we help families in Africa avoid famine and uh, through, after following drought and, and, and floods. And we also support the teaching of children at the grade school level in Africa, in one of the poorest countries on the planet, in Burkina Faso. Uh, they, they're learning re re uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, reforestation, and solar energy production. I have two, uh, two uh, copies of an article from uh, jo Dr. Joseph Mercola, who is the number one 
uh, natural health website on the planet, number nine in all health websites. He uh, has an article. You can go on, I'll give you two copies of this, and you can look on his website and watch a 20-minute video on regenerative farming, restoring soil health, and saving Americans from cancer and chronic disease. And San Jose has the possibility, has the Thank opportunity you. to really, really, really inspire uh, the people of this state Thank and you the so world much for your time. Your time work. is up. Thank you. Can Give Next up is Darian Lee, followed by Eleni Jacobson, and then Derek Bryant. Hello, I'm Darian Lee. I'm actually from Sunnyvale, so I'm kind of like a tourist here. And like on behalf of like all the tourists in San Jose, I can say that this is like your guys' main tourist attraction. So like lots of revenue there. <laughs> but um, also, so I took envir advanced placement environmental science last year, and it really got me interested in agriculture and what, how, how it's affecting the planet today. And I'm not going to go into detail because I don't have a lot of time, but it is like majorly screwed up. So when I found out about this place in the fall, I was like super stoked because like this place is like doing it perfectly. Like we're growing all the food where the people are so you don't have to transport it. You're growing native crops that don't take a lot of water. They're used to the California drought and they're drawing in native pollinators that can like restore all the ecosystems. It's super cool. And um, you're renewing the soil so that you can keep growing stuff there for a long time. And it's not just one garden, like, well, it is one garden, but it, it can be so much more than that because other places can see this garden and learn from it. And we can, we can have places like this, like, all over the U.S. And you guys can start it. Like, this is, like, your guys. Then I know, like, you can't, like, there's private property rights, so obviously you can't just, like, ignore that and, like, mm, give us your garden. Like, but the, you can, like, like, stall it a bit, like, give us some more time to get funds. Like, is, is that too hard? <laughs> and then, and then you guys would be like superheroes because we'd have like all these gardens everywhere and it would be like, oh, who did that? Oh, it was those people. Oh, that's so cool. So um, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. It was a very compelling argument, the prospect of becoming a superhero. Eleni Jacobson followed by Derek Bryant and then Emmeline DeLong. Hello, my name is Eleni Jacobson. Um, may I quickly ask the applicant's name again? Fred. Fred. Fred? Okay, Fred. thank you. Um, so many have spoken on the merits of this space and I won't talk further on that. Um, however, one thing is very clear to me and that is that Fred deserves to be very fairly compensated for his valuable land that he owns and for the leeway that he has given to this space for the past 20 years. If indeed uh, his claim is true that the tens of thousands of dollars that he is owed, um, then, then he, he needs to be compensated for that money. Um, let us not forget that he is an individual working with this system the best that he can as well. However, one other thing is also totally clear to me. Um, uh, um, there is something that is irreplaceable and that is the faith that that the children in here have in their local government that has not been eroded to the point that those of us who are a bit older have lost faith in their government. And it's regrettable to me that should this development go through and this play space of theirs be lost, that it will be possibly their first exposure to how unfair this system is. And, and that is a generational loss that may not be recovered. So for the sake of our community, um, I strongly encourage a, a, a delay in the decision as, as we are requesting. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Derek Bryant, followed by Emmeline DeLong, and then Carrie Viarnez Araya. Hello, my name is Derek Bryant. I am a urban agriculturist. Um, I, own, I um, have a few community gardens, one in Milpitas. Now I live in San Jose. 
Um, I'm a master composter and I am the first uh, community garden coordinator for the city of Santa Clara. Um, city of Santa Clara, the city fin finally got their first community garden um, and they plan on getting more and more following the lead of San Jose who has many community gardens. Um, when I first got into urban agriculture, Middlebrook was one of the first places I visited and um, hadn't returned until recently when my daughter joined their uh, program this summer. Of course, uh, force feeding urban agriculture down my daughter's throat, she denies it, but just the other day she was like, I love this garden. And um, overcame her fear of chickens and all that. But um, what I wanna say is, um, you know, I walked up and down Ray Street and, um, you know, debilitated area. If there's anything uh, that you guys are gonna tear down or that should be torn down, the garden is the last thing that should be torn down. Um, there are many organizations, and as being in this business for a while, uh, been trying to connect all these organizations to come together and um, work together to save spaces like this. I think what we're hearing today is a lot of us found out about this a little bit too late, and um, uh, Mrs. Middlebrook, uh, has the support behind her to make something beautiful happen in this place. Um, we also want to get this landowner paid. I want to call your attention to AB 551. It is the uh, ordinance where he can get a tax write-off for that land um, if it's used for agricultural purpose. Uh, but uh, I hope you allow us some more time for all of us to come together and save this space and make something beautiful out of it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Emmeline DeLong. Hi, my name is Emmeline DeLong, and I live on Luther Avenue up there. It's pretty close to uh, the Middlebrook Gardens. I am the mother of three small children, and we are very connected there. We walk our neighborhood almost daily, and so we see everything that's going on all the time. I'm always looking around, making sure my kids are safe, and um, I really do love my community, my neighborhood. Um, we bought a house, a fixer upper. Big reason was because this place was there to, for my children to be. Um, I grew up in Mendocino County, so moving to San Jose was a big decision, a different decision for me. And having these gardens close by is huge, a big deciding factor on why we moved there. Um, so them being gone would really, really be beyond words hard for my family, my kids, because we go there on a weekly basis and have fun preschool time really discovering uh, nature. And they ask so many questions, they learn so many things beyond what they could learn in the classroom. I know that this is um, Frank's property and I want to respect that and I want to, um, really just to plead the, the, the community of San Jose that we, we find a way um, to make this happen to where we can all be on the same page and, rest, and keep this place the way it is. Um, and, and have it grow and be a model for, for um, the rest of San Jose because this place is extremely important um, for my children's health to, health to thrive in the, in the community, in the neighborhood. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for your time. That's everything. Thank you. Next up is Carrie Viarnes Araya and then the last speaker card I have is Joseph Price. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Carrie Viernes Araya. I do also live in this neighborhood a few blocks from the garden. I understand the gentleman's argument that he has a right to do what he wishes with his land. However, as a member of this community and a resident of this neighborhood, I would also like to have a say. My children attended preschool here at, at, at the garden and they learned so much there. They'd never really been known, know how to feed chickens or rabbits or know how kale grows. And they learned a lot and I think it's really important. Uh, we've also strengthened a lot of community ties in this garden. I've met a lot of families in my neighborhood and that just doesn't happen these days. People don't know their neighbors. We love our garden. We don't love Panera. We don't love parking lots and we don't need them. I believe in the importance of community gardens and education and land stewardship. As a nation, as a planet, we are at a critical juncture in the climate crisis. We must stop prioritizing concrete over nature, corporate development over community development. Panera will generate plastic waste, which we do not need, food waste, 
and contribute to increased traffic in our neighborhood. It may also negatively impact smaller locally owned businesses and bakeries that are just around the corner. We have plenty of restaurants in Midtown Rose Garden area, but precious few public community gardens. What are we teaching the next generation about our values and morals if we allow yet another corporate retail development in our neighborhood? We need environmental education, not more concrete jungles. This council has already, much to my chagrin, agreed to allow Google to take over our lovely neighborhood. I could not be more furious about that. It will impact every aspect of my life and I may end up losing my rental because of it. Enough is enough. Green over greed, nature over parking lots, slow food, not fast food. Please have conscience. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Joseph Price. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I grew up here in San Jose in Willow Glen when Willow Glen was a much more unassuming part of the, part of the city. And I've watched many uh, initiatives to do things like revitalize downtown. A lot of these were ill-fated. And to be honest, when I, I've always felt like it was a bit of a liability to say that I'm from San Jose over the years. Because we always seem to be a few steps behind the Bay Area and other places. Now Google can come in and wave their magic wand and we'll look good, you know, and, but this, the soul and the livability and the quality of life is something that should, I, I believe, be front and center. And this is an opportunity to lead. This is one tiny portion of one block. And there's nothing else like it around. You can put in parks. You can, you know, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't even get bathrooms or drinking fountains over at K Hill Park. You know, like, where, where are the priorities? You know, we need to really think about this kind of thing. That's all, all I want to say. This is an opportunity to lead. I'm addressing you guys and those whose seats you're now occupying, who have been part of this. You've managed to drag some people downtown to spend their money now. It's actually a fun place to be now. Congratulations. But I think there's more to a city and its, and its, uh, and its value and what makes uh, people and human beings um, happy. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And Chair, Thank I you. just wanted to let the speaker know that Cahill Park was designed to have bathrooms, but the community was absolutely opposed, and they didn't happen with the fear of creepy people being in the bathrooms, and that's why there's no bathrooms there, but the city had intended on doing that in 2005. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, beside the point, though, actually. Well, I want you to know. <laughs> All right, Tessa, you're up, and you get to close everything out for us. Oh, so under a climate emergency that we are on and ecological collapse, so when we look at the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that says we have 10 years to reduce 50%. So what is 50%, okay? Our whole economy is based on fossil fuels. We have destroyed our natural, um, our natural habitat. We have no natural habitat. And our whole artificial habitat is fueled by fossil fuels. So everything about our economy is connected directly with fossil fuels. So when they say reduce 50%, what does that look like? Well, the way the economists are saying it looks like in America, that we are such high fossil fuel users, we are, to reduce 50% means no driving, no flying, no movement of goods. No jobs, doesn't mean there won't be work, there'll be lots of work, and there'll be no money. So essentially, we're going back to the Native American way of living and an agrarian. We need to go back and live a more agrarian. We need to be, like Allery says, more like plants, that that is the more way that we're, the more native way, natural way for us to be. So if we have no movement of goods, what that means is that there is no food at the Safeway, at the Trader Joe's, at the you know, whatever places we're buying it, because there will be no diesel trucks bringing them in. There will be no boats, no flying, nothing. That's no 
no movement of goods, okay? So that means we've got to become a resilient community. And we know that if the city of San Jose is aware of the problems with PG&E as, as they shut off our power. And our mayor says, oh, well, I'm not gonna let that happen. We've gotta become a resilient community. And the way we become a resilient community is to grow our own food. That is what is going to unify us as community members. We've got to pull up our, our, our lawns and learn to live sustainably. And that's what Allery is going to teach us. And we're going to take all the open space thank you, thank you, that Tessa. is undeveloped and take it like Allery has done. And she will, we only have a couple thank more you, years. Thank you, Tessa, She's your time is up. So we need to use her knowledge to all open space should become land for growing food. Thank you, Tessa. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Are you going to let the applicant and the appellant I was advised by the city attorney that they don't come back down, but if they are? So usually I think the applicant and then the appellant has the final. All right. <laughs> so how, so. Five minutes each class. Okay. I believe it's still five minutes. All right, so the applicant first. They, uh, applicant and then the appellant finish. Would the applicant like to come down and respond to anything? And so five minutes to um, respond to what's been said or answer any questions that the commission might have. To all of us, uh, that's so precious of you. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, what Audrey is doing According to the lease that she signed 20 years ago, she did not open institution to edu for education. She opened a gardening place and not educational office or school. That's this one. She's doing something against her lease. But What I want to say, <clears throat> I have Can you to be go. sure to speak into the microphone so yes. everyone can hear you? Thank can you. you. Hear me now? Okay. Uh, I give her time, but I cannot stop my project. I will give her time within uh, what I have to do to build my property. It is my property. I have the right to do whatever is permitted by the city of San Jose regulations and zoning. All the things considered, you know, I have to do what's right for my family. <clears throat> but I will be nice again and give her time to go ahead and find whoever she wants to find to come in and if they have I have not heard anything from anybody. No one has approached me yet to say they are interested in purchasing the property. If they come in within the time that I'm doing my, pro my project, yes, I will work with them. If the terms and conditions are right, I will work with them. I let them buy it. I let them keep it as, and use it for whatever use they want. But all the people are using this land with whose cost? My cost. I have obligation. I do not receive rent. I do not get anything from this land. And I think it's very unfair to continue. And she will be out soon as, you know, termination because she, she's not paying rent and she's not doing what it's supposed to do. That's all I have to say. Uh, she's, I mean, she's asking for donation from people, $15 person, come and pay this and that. I have emails, I have uh, on Facebook that she's asking for $15 donation. I don't know, it's wasting my time wasting your time, and it's been going on for the last 20 years.
Thank you very much, and I, I assume that I will be approved for my project. I appreciate it. Thank you. Do any of the any commissioners questions? have questions? All right. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you. And so I wanted to invite the appellant up. Uh, thank you. I am still asking for a postponement because we are in, a, in, in negotiation and it's been mandated by the Superior Court. I have not paid rent since the eviction started because I, I'm not supposed to. There are disputes between uh, Mr. Sultan's ad and I over the course of the time that I've been there. I have paid rent for 20 years. The photographs that you saw, this is a proposal and it was sent today to Cindy Chavez, the head of Catholic Charities. It was sent to uh, Chancellor Breland at San Jose City College. I did hear back from him. He is interested in a partnership. We are already working with his teacher, um, Professor Data, and you heard the young man, Mike uh, Maker, who is also a voting member of the uh, Board of Trustees for San Jose City College in Evergreen. Um, I'm confident I had a meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting with Cindy Chavez and she is confident with low-income housing, uh, a deal with Catholic Charities and the bishop, most of the land, except for the houses that uh, Pierre mentioned. Um, I just need more time, a postponement, so that we can continue to work together. I've worked with these people you know, I was the founder of San Jose Beautiful. I won, we won a top award for the River Street Garden Project. I've been a volunteer in the city and recognized by the city over the last 30 years. And I asked just for a postponement so that Fred can get his compensation that he deserves. And he will get it from a major institution. It's not going to be from the community. It's going to be a major institution who would like to see this become a center for sustainability and youth education. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have questions? All right. Um, then at this point, I wanted to uh, turn it over to staff to respond to any of the comments that came up. There are quite a few comments, but um, at least the areas that are within germane to my land use. Um, I believe one of the uh, public speakers I was sure talked about land use policy 5.3 about intensification of the land. Um, when we consider projects coming in, we do have to take in consideration of adjacent uses. Um, we, NCC designation doesn't have a minimum density. What the proposed project would be replacing a single family home and a commercial business on there. So it did, we did, city did find that is consistent with the land use policy in terms of doing that. Um, it, it's kind of hard because it's always a fight back between what's too intense, what's not intense with the community, and we can't force applicants to do projects that may or may not pencil out given some of the history on that site. And in, um, in regards to time as well, so with this permit, um, we did uh, have a condition that extended it typically from two years after approval to um, pull a building for the building permit to four years. So with this, uh, the permittee may request up to two one-year extensions for a total of now six years um, to pull building permits before the permit expires. Um, and we also would like to note that during this time, the tenant and owner um, can still negotiate the terms for the continuance of the use of the garden. Uh, the approval of this project does not require Fred to uh, build the, the um, post project. Um, and yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, great. Um, do any of my colleagues on the commission have questions for staff at this point? Commissioner Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for city attorney, um, you have a, an applicant uh, that's gone through the process, approved once, uh, coming back a second time, uh, meets the general plan, meets the zoning. If a planning commission in that situation in the state of California said, you know what, for an arbitrary reason that has nothing to do with land use, I don't want to approve this, what type of uh, litigation does that open the city to? Yeah, so what's before the planning commission is really does the project meet the requirement under the municipal code? And that is, does it meet the general plan? Does it meet the zoning? Does it meet the applicable policies of the city of San Jose? Um, to answer your question, if the planning commission has no facts or information in the record to support the decision, um, and there's a, a lawsuit, a subsequent lawsuit, I mean, that opens up to the city acting arbitrary um, there's due process violation. There could be a regulatory taking. There's a number of different causes of action that may be pursued against the city. Um, I just want to do focus the planning commission on ultimately what's before you is there's a determination by the planning director that they that he made a determination that the project meets the requirements in the municipal code and it meets the, it's consistent and further the policies of the general plan it conforms with the zoning code and it meets applicable policies and it meets state law in terms of CEQA so if you're going to either upheld or deny the um, appeal is a de novo hearing um, you're going to have to have substantial evidence in the record to support your decision based on those findings thank you Commissioner Griswold so I had a, a question for staff um, around the CEQA analysis and, um, and specifically the determination that it was um, exempt and that um, it didn't, I guess the exceptions under 15, um, section uh, 15300.2 didn't apply. And the one um, exception that I had a question about was the significant effect. And if staff could speak a little bit more on what is meant by a significant effect and whether the gardens might be considered an unusual circumstance that would um, take it out of a categorical, categorical exemption under CEQA. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. David Keon, Principal Planner for the Environment Review Division. So in particular for CEQA, um, the finding that there is an unusual circumstance is intended for a situation where, for example, if you are on a, a, a site that has like a, for a zone for a single family house, but it is on a landslide, the, the determination that it's on a landslide could be actually found to be an unusual circumstance that makes this property have unusual environmental constraints compared to other, um, other projects, other single family zone properties. Um, the presence of a native garden on the site, it's a garden, it's landscaping. It is not an unusual circumstance because um, nurseries, um, gardens that are made, you know, private landscaping that is put on private properties is not really an unusual circumstance because it's common. People can plant, you know, their, plant their gardens. I know several nurseries up and down th in this area that have actually disappeared over the past several years, but they had similar landscaping. And, you know, it's essentially, you know, while it's sad, to see some of these gardens go, it is not an unusual circumstance that is warranting that to kick this out of an exception. And the, actually the exception would apply kicking it out of an exemption. So again, it's mainly applying to certain circumstances like, you know, okay, the exception that, you know, there are unusual, unusual um, geologic circumstances. Is there um, some, you know, example, is the property historic? Um, there has been historic evaluation done that found it not to be historic. Um, therefore, um, the city determined that an exemption to CEQA was the appropriate level. Thank you. Does the um, significant effect or the unusual circumstances ever apply legally to um, sort of an unusual or particular use of some merit within a community? I mean, because I think 
what is what I'm sort of struggling with is that this seems to fall a little bit outside. It's you know it's got some it's got some historic value, but not in the legal sense of the um, historical evaluation. Um, and so I, I guess I want to make sure that if the record is clear as to um, why this would be outside of an unusual circumstance, because it's not just a garden. It's not just regular landscaping, and it's, you know, it's, um, it's more in the, it's, I would say, in the neighborhood of maybe what they have in the Berkeley Gardens, or it's more of a habitat. So the, so the habitat is, it's meant as a demonstration garden, as part, and also as a, a nursery. Um, that is, it, you know, it's not something that would, is actually part of a broader ecosystem. Um, if this had been actually part of a broader ecosystem, native habitat that wasn't planted, that was part of a you know, broader, larger ecosystem, that could be something that could be considered as part of something to further study that could kick it out of an exemption. Um, but you know, there's been nothing presented, no substantial evidence submitted su stating that this is, you know, such an unusual circumstance that you know because it's being used as you know a native nursery that that warrants. Um, you know, additional higher level of, of environmental review. Okay. Commissioner Yesney, did you want to ask a question? Any of my other colleagues? All right, then it sounds like we're ready to entertain a motion. Why is everyone looking at me? Okay, I, I move staff's recommendation. There's a motion to move staff's recommendation. Is there a second? A second. To right. just clarify, is that also with the ad, ad, added condition about the native? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Tang. That is with the added condition applied by Ms. Yesney. Thank you. And would you like to comment on your motion? Uh, no, other than just um, thank every single person who came out to speak tonight, whether you were at the uh, appellant, the applicant, a supporter of the gardens, a community member. Um, I know how difficult it is because I've stood at that podium many times myself speaking before the council and other commissions, including this commission when I wasn't serving on it. Um, so I know how difficult it is and I appreciate you coming and uh, speaking your minds and having your voices heard. Unfortunately, it does not appear that um, we're in a position to be able to assist in uh, the endeavor that you are uh, hoping to undertake tonight. Um, but there is a much bigger picture at play and my, to echo Commissioner Ballard's comment, I know that we all are very sympathetic and very much understand and are very much passionate about that issue from my understanding. So um, I urge you to uh, explore all of the other endeavors that the city is actually undertaking in terms of a macro approach to climate change, including the Climate Smart Plan, which is embedded into our general plan, which has given uh, the property owner the right to do this on his property. Um, so I would encourage you to get, stay involved, stay engaged with the city, learn more about the process and find out ways that we can hopefully uh, help you to interject yourselves earlier in a process when you can have more of an impact. Um, but unfortunately, our hands are somewhat tied tonight and um, I believe that the property owner does have the right to, uh, to move forward at this point. So thank you for your time. Commissioner Yesney, would you like to speak to the motion? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, s several people have been asking questions, and I have one. How many of any of the people in this room, other than the staff, have heard of, seen, looked at, touched, or in any way been aware of the city's general plan? That's great. Someone said that we're acting based on policies and laws, but with no goals. The city's general plan is nothing but goals. It gives us things to aspire to, plans to deal with, methods to get there, and it's based on goals that were developed not by the people in this room, but by thousands of citizens of San Jose who spent many hours working on them. Now, you don't like right now what's gonna happen on this property. Do something about it change the general plan. Yet, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't wait till the last minute. M Mrs. Um, 
<laughs> Middlebrook, I was gonna say Middlefield for some reason. Mrs. Middlebrook, whom I've also known for a long time, has known for 20 years that she didn't own this property. And she's brought you into a wonderful effort to create something new. But she doesn't own this property and neither do you. And neither do we. The city can only decide on public uses on property they either intend to buy or own. Okay. Uh, I'll, right. I'll bet you wouldn't like anybody parking on your property. Okay, okay. All right. My I think Commissioner Griswold had some comments. So um, I do have some comments. And um, I have a lot of sympathy for the property owner. Um, and I do feel it's not the responsibility of individual property owners to provide public space. And that many of the people here have essentially asked us for an almost de facto like eminent domain. And that's not appropriate. But what I do think is our responsibility, and which is why I am not going to vote in favor, um, is that I think that we have all of the general plan is about trade-offs. And, um, and that the proposed um, project needs to justify those trade-offs. And within the general plan, there are a number of goals that often we can cite that this uh, goal is going to uh, weigh in favor of the project but there are countervailing goals in, in the general plan here. And specifically, I think land use policy 12.1, which is to maintain existing and facilitate the development of community gardens, is a land use policy that um, was not um, considered. Um, but sort of more importantly, I think that um, the land use policy of 5.3, the intensification, that unless we have intense development. Um, I don't think we're going to solve our uh, climate crisis, which, as we all believe, is um, probably the greatest uh, threat facing all of us today. And this is a one, basically a one-story building where uh, the proposed building is 4,800 square feet and the existing building is 2,314 square feet. And for an additional 2,500 square feet, it doesn't, doesn't justify the impact, in my view. So that's why I'm going to vote no. Commissioner Labor, Vice Chair Labor. I hate to be a scold, um, but at the top of this room and at the entrance, there's a whole uh, thing in the agenda about rules of conduct, and I'd really appreciate it if all of you adhered to them. We, we listen very politely to all of you. Um, I actually agree with Commissioner Griswold on this. Um, the general plan is full of environmental policies and goals for the city. As she said, and as Mr. Shore mentioned, um, the land use intensification 5.3 um, to encourage new and intensification of existing commercial development. Um, to me, that's a really overriding concern. I'm disappointed in, I mean, I, again, I hate to be a scold here, I'm disappointed in both the applicant as well as the appellant, because from the applicant, I'd like to see more for the city in terms of um, commercial intensification on a very pedestrian-oriented corridor. And then from the appellant, you've had 20 years on a site where you've brought all these community people along to a vision that's great and it's what we should be pursuing but it's not your property and you've known for 20 years that it's not yours so that's that's really highly problematic and I'm also moved by the fact when I look at the the map over here I guess it's up on the left but I I have it blown up full screen here when you look at this site this half acre in the middle, or actually on the edge of the St. Leo's neighborhood and abutting um, Shasta Hanship Park, if you know this neighborhood, and I do because I lived nearby for about 10 years, and actually over half the people on, on the dais up here um, have lived in, you know, within a mile of this place, there's not a park anywhere around here other than people's private gardens and backyards. This part of San Jose, like most of this city, 
is highly parks deficient. Right now, in the name of the housing crisis and lots of other things, there are movements afoot to get rid of um, the generation of park fees from development in this city to reduce them or eliminate them entirely. That's the only dollars that get generated to, to produce parks. So we have, we have a shortage of parks and, and our park spaces, public and private, um, or our opportunities for those are disappearing. So, so that's where I'm really conflicted because I want to see more I want to see both more intensification on the commercial side or, and on the residential side, but at the same time, I, I also see, you know, value in a, in a place like, like this. So um, I, I know that sounds kind of strange to, to feel both sides of this, but, but what I'm hearing from all of you is this shortage of, of garden space, of green space, of park space in, in your area, and not just in your area, but serving, serving all of the city. So, um, really, though, for me, um, it's about all of those other overriding land use considerations. I want to see um, more of a treatment of that. So for that reason, I would vote no at this time. All right. Again, if you could keep your... We, we, can't, uh, we can't hear from folks in the audience. Please, um, I want to underscore that uh, we need to keep our clapping uh, in check and our emotions in check. Um, and I wanted to ask if any of my colleagues have anything else to add. All right, Commissioner Oliverio. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I had to echo uh, Ch Commissioner Allen's comments on thanking everyone from the community for showing up. Uh, ultimately, it's difficult to always agree if any level of government's decision, uh, but it's part of the process and it's appreciated. Um, I, I visit, I think several of us have visited, I visited it over several years, uh, understanding the uh, situation that it was in is, it was brought up that uh, not owning land uh, makes it very difficult, whether you're a renter or a commercial business, uh, and that if you don't own, you don't have that certainty. And the country is founded on private property rights. I do not have the right to tell my neighbor who wants to sell their home, wait a minute, I want there to be something else, and you should forgo that. That just doesn't exist in the United States even as much as the sincere feelings that neighbor may have or the sincere feelings that everyone has towards this garden. And it's not a park, it's a business that's closed during the evening and closed when it's not open. So it's not really a park and shouldn't be considered a park. It is a beautiful amenity that adds to environmental education and all the things that you've spoken about that I think we all agree with. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's private property. Um, there's a documentary film I recommend you seeing if you're passionate about this garden and it's called The Garden. And it's a situation in Los Angeles where a piece of private property was allowed to be gardened. And this thing was transformed, much like this parcel, into this beautiful, lush, incredible garden. And it was there for years. And the private property owner wanted to do something different. And it went to Los Angeles City Council. And you'll see in the movie, there's a thousand plus people marching on City Hall. But the city, being that it's in California, had to allow the private property owner to do that. There is no legal reason under CEQA to deny this application. Any, you know, I, I guess I have the benefit of sitting in closed session for 10 years and seeing the amount of litigation the city faces. And when we as commissioners are aware and told by the city attorney that there is no legal reason under CEQA to deny the project, and then we consider voting opposite of the city attorney, I think that's irresponsible. I, I think we, we need to focus on uh, what, what we do as a planning commission. We are not miracle workers. We are here to implement the general plan and approve applications within the general plan and zoning that professional planning staff recommends to us. And, and that's our job. Uh, city council, they have flexibility. They could say, you know what? I'm not gonna fund that fire station I'm gonna take that money and buy this piece of private property. But we as a commission don't have that authority and we don't have that flexibility to do so. So we're in a much more uh, narrow way. Uh, so for people that believe in these types of uses, clearly advocate your elected officials for either budgetary allocations or advocate for tax increases to pay for this, for these types of uses, parks, community gardens, et cetera. There will be an opportunity for a community garden not far from here at Del Monte Park for phase three. That land was already purchased years ago. And a community garden is one of the options for that 
next um, next usage as it goes into its planning session. Um, uh, you know, I feel really sad for the, uh, I think it's Fred. Um, you know, obviously I can tell by the accent, you, you, you're an immigrant, you've worked probably pretty hard uh, in life. And, uh, you know, and I do really appreciate two of the speakers who were, you know, kind to him because it is a, a dilemma. Uh, we're not here to tell you what to do with your own property. And, you know, so I, you know, it, it's difficult in your position. And again, this is so rare to not to have an applicant not show up with a lobbyist. So I, I really, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I feel for everyone in the situation, but I have to defer to what uh, state laws state law is. And, um, you know, when we talk about the general plan about facilitating community gardens, it's facilitated through parks, not by taking someone's private property, but by public development of parks and or if there's a large uh, complex, let's say there's 400 units and then we can c incorporate a community garden with that. But the general plan is not to say we're taking private property and making that a community garden. And so um, and I and I know there's this. Well, so I went to that community meeting uh, and, and the sentiment was what was shared here. No one was really in favor of it. Everyone was against and for the same reasons uh, for environmental. And um, and I met Gavin, excellent spokesman. That kid's going to do great in life. Um, but, you know, when someone brought up and I think it's the same speaker who came tonight who said, let's make it a bigger building. No one supported it. <laughs> so here we have an application that, again, that fits within the rules. We don't have minimum set up to, to make it happen. The general plan process is going to start again at the, you know, in about four months or whatever. That's going to be the big discussion. Do we put minimums in so that every time a development happens, you have to build a tall building? But that's not the law right now. Those aren't the city ordinances. So uh, I respect the professional planning staff that went through the process the first time and respect the work they've done the second time and the recommendation from the city attorney. So I'm going to support the motion. Uh, yeah. The attorney's office has something to say. Yeah. I'll always defer to the attorney. You know, I, I just want to clarify for the record that earlier when I spoke, I was asked about a hypothetical, hypothetical question, and I answered a hypothetical question. Um, as an attorney for the city, I advise the planning commission. I'm not a voting member of the planning commission, and ultimately, this is a planning commission decision. And the only thing I said earlier was that whatever decision you make, it needs to be based on the municipal code, the general plan, the zoning code, and the policies. I'm not recommending the planning commission to vote one way or another, and that's definitely not my job. Um, so I just did two things earlier. I answered a hypothetical question, and I just reminded the commission on the required findings you have to make, and you need to have evidence in the record to su support your decision. And ultimately, it's your decision. So I know Commissioner Allen, you wanted to speak, but I would like to speak first and Please. then you can speak since I have not yet. Um, so, and I, I'm gonna go back to probably asking staff a few questions, but first I wanted to say, and as Vice Chair Leba mentioned, um, a lot of us live near this site. I actually live three blocks from it. I have volunteered time at the site a few years back. Um, so I just wanted to disclose that. Um, and I check to make sure that I don't have a conflict of interest and, and I'm clear, so I am permitted to vote on this. Um, I too, when I was looking through this and reading the staff report, um, had a similar reaction to uh, one of the folks who came down here, Alex Shore, um, and my first reaction was, why is this building so short? If we're going to get rid of a very loved asset in the community, we better make sure that the trade-off is a good one and we are putting something in that place that really intensifies the use, makes the most of a valuable infill site, um, and creates that more pedestrian um, orientation that we're looking for that can move us towards a land use pattern that encourages people to get out of their cars, walk, bike, um, and not drive solo around uh, everywhere. So I, um, that was my initial reaction, was that this is not intense enough. Um, and then also my, my other reaction, assuming that the, the drawings that we saw um, in the staff report are what is proposed, that the design piece, and I know this is not something we necessarily are supposed to spend a lot of time on, but um, 
I have been disappointed in the past with some of the decisions that have been made um, at, at um, and staff is wonderful, so I, I really don't want to denigrate staff, but um, uh, decisions that I felt about design in that neighborhood were not respectful of um, the character of the neighborhood. So right down the street on the next block, you have some really interesting designs. Art Boutique is there. Um, you know, you, it's, it's pushed up close to the sidewalk and it's just unique stuff and some of it's two story also. Um, and so I was dismayed that the design as it's portrayed in the staff report uh, for the project is very modern looking and it looks like it, I mean, maybe it's trying to take its cues from the, from the church next door. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say that for the record that I've been, I was disappointed in the design I, I, and that flows from, there were a couple homes that were approved in the St. Leo's neighborhood, a neighborhood where almost every single house has a detached garage that is set back from the street. And um, there have been two homes that have been approved lately where there are big fat garages just, you know, announcing themselves in this neighborhood. And um, so I'm just, I say that because I just want to get that on the record that in this neighborhood, I think it's very special. It's one of the few special neighborhoods in San Jose that really has some unique design elements that we should carry forward. And I know that's something we can all argue, argue about. Um, I also wanted to just say this, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for the applicant here. Um, and, um, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're hearing from the community uh, and a, a wonderful, you know, leader in the community who's volunteering a lot of time to do good stuff, that there are these conversations happening and there's commitments and, um, you know, I've talked with so-and-so and there's a partnership, yet none of those people are here. Um, and so that makes me, um, you know, very you know, suspicious is a strong word, but like unless they're here, it's hard for us to really take the word of someone who has had a long time to be thinking about this stuff um, and bring those people here so that we're not just taking someone's word for it, especially when the applicant is saying, you know, I've been taking her word for a long time and I've been giving her the benefit of the doubt. So I just wanted to put that out there that that, you know, I hope, I would hope that there are some awesome partnership opportunities out there, but um, you know, it's, it's hard for us simply to take someone's word for that when those folks aren't here and we're not seeing proof of any of those conversations or a letter of intent or an MOU or, or something like that. Um, that said, I wanted to ask some questions of staff specifically on the intensity of the site. And again, I know that you responded to Alex's raising of this concern, but I'd like to hear you just again, why you went with such a low intensity use here. Um, and then also if you could recap the process for this project that got it to this point. So the NCC designation, unlike a regional commercial or some of the higher density general plan designation, it's kind of a balance that when you're in these kind of residential neighborhood, there should be something of an appropriate scale. So the NCC designation only has a maximum FAR of two. There is no minimum to that component. So if an applicant comes with a project of a certain intensity, they also have to consider the policy and constraints of their stormwater, the parking ratio, um, whether belief or not, they have to conform to those codes. And then in other projects that you've heard before, people are concerned, the project's too big, traffic is a concern, so it always becomes a balance. It's a very tough position for a staff to say, hey, we saw this one specific policy 5.3, we don't think it's intense enough. And then there's a bunch of other policies that says, be consistent with, with your, your adjacent uses, try to minimize certain impacts and other aspects. So it all becomes a balancing act. Ultimately, the city aren't developers. We have to look at these projects and what they're proposing in consistency with our policies. So, it, it, um, so it's, that's kind of the, the frame that we have to kind of consider in this project. Um, those weren't really brought up as part of community concerns saying that this project wasn't intense um, in terms of doing it. Some people did bring it up, but a lot of people also said, I don't want the project there. It's gonna generate traffic and all these other things. So we just have to look for consistency with those policies. If I could add, if I could add to this, my, uh, Michael Brio, 
NCC neighbor community commercial is the lowest intensity land commercial land use designation in the general plan. It has the word neighborhood in it. Not to say that you couldn't do more intense in the right context with support and et cetera, but for those reasons, we're not establishing a minimum that you have to have a two-story building. A lot, you know, in a lot of places, a one-story building is, is is appropriate. Maybe it could be more than that, but it's really we we allow flexibility for the market to figure out what can you do, what what can be penciled out. So that's really, again, the reason why there isn't a minimum that you do two, three, four stories. Um, and, and and it's and I think it's it, it you know we're, this, we're trying to facilitate development within those parameters. Um, doing a two-story commercial building may be feasible in some locations, may not be. So we don't believe that we should have a minimum that requires two levels, uh, two stories citywide. Um, actually, Commissioner Allen was in line, but is this related to the? Yeah. Um, okay. Just um. You know, I actually looked up the FAR on the neighborhood community commercial and just wanted to correct it because I'm, I think it's 3.5. So just that we're all basing it on the same I information. I apologize. I've been around the department a bit too long. It was two. I think it did go up to 3.5. Um, but yes. Commissioner Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just speaking again to the motion um, and in the interest of hopefully getting us off of what might be a split vote, I'm not really sure how a couple of your at least one of you are voting, but it looks like we might be headed to a split vote, and that would be unfortunate, I think. Um, regarding, a uh, lot's been said about private property already tonight and the legal concerns. Um, something that staff likes to bring up when we talk about converting industrial land potentially to other uses is precedent. We hear a lot about precedent. Um, I don't necessarily want to put the city attorney on the spot again. I'm not an attorney. I know one of us is, um, and <laughs> I would point out that this a decision like uh, this to... to infringe upon the owner's property rights given all of the parameters of, of this situation could lead to a, um, a an unfortunate precedent with other appellants coming forward on other projects in the future and uh, we could set a really bad precedent for this commission. I just want to point that out. Um, I'm, I have been and I'm on record on this commission as being massively in favor of a commercial displacement policy for the city of San Jose. We have policies in place that are reflected in state law regarding renters, right, residential renters, and how we can protect them. Protect them not meaning keep them in their apartment if their landlord or their own property owner decides to tear it down and rebuild, but provide opportunity for the, them to find new housing, to find housing in the new complex, and to have the landlord and the developer actually support that process, right? That's actually a policy the city has and is working on preserving, and I really encourage anyone to continue supporting that policy because it's under attack consistently by developers and landlords. Um, similarly, I believe we should have a policy around commercial displacement, especially of small businesses, and especially in circum circumstances like this. Now, that policy wouldn't buy the land. That wouldn't po policy wouldn't provide $4 million to buy the land at fair market value. What it would do, though, is provide an opportunity for uh, working with the applicant or, or uh, applicant and the appellant to figure out a way to, to move the gardens to another location and to make sure everyone makes out, right? I wish that policy were in place right now, and if that policy were in place right now, it would probably apply to the situation, and we might have some better mitigation for the concerns that we're hearing tonight. But I also come from a previous position on the Arts Commission. And if anyone happens to know, uh, open space and gardens and parks are not the only thing in danger of being uh, extinct here in San Jose. And that's arts spaces, art space, p p space for people to do their work as artists and to create and to build the community that you're trying to build here as well. Um, and I'll point out a couple examples, and they're actually in the neighborhood where Artists were forced out of their spaces because of development like this, but through hustle and determination and putting their nose to the grindstone like has been said, has been, is being done tonight. They did build partnerships. They did work with other landlords and they were able to find locations. One of them right around the corner on the Alameda in an old, where an old baseball batting cage is now being used for artist studios, professional artist studios. A, a commercial enterprise and a nonprofit at the same time, providing education to the community. Hopefully, folks in the community who are going to be missing out on educational programming at the gardens, School of Visual Philosophy. It's at Fontanetti's, the old Fontanetti's on the Alameda 1065. I invite you to go up there. They have classes in all sorts of different art disciplines. Your kids will love it. Very affordable, if not free, in some cases. Another example, the very next block up, which was mentioned by Commissioner Ballard, the uh, art boutique. -y. They were forced out of their original space downtown 
on, I believe, South First Street or Market, right where, where those come together. If anyone's familiar with the Pierce development, it's a new residential tower down this way. It's got an interesting light sculpture on top of it. You can see it from 280, probably. Um, so the Art Boutique used to be housed in a building that was on that site. The property owner decided they were going to redevelop it. They were allowed to do that. The city said, yes, you can do that. And my friend, who owns the Art Boutique, he had to find a new place to do his business, to have a space for artists to come and musicians to perform. I'm a musician myself, so I really appreciate it. And for the community to come together. And he did it. And he worked with the city. He worked with the neighborhood. Can you imagine trying to get... I can't imagine what he had to go through to get a music venue established across the street from my neighborhood, the Shasta Hanchet neighborhood, traditionally one of the most opposed to any kind of densification, development, or change. I cannot imagine what he had to go through to do it, but he did it, and he's still there, and it's surviving. So what I'll say is this. I toured this facility three years ago when I was running for city council. I would love to have gotten on the city council to be able to affect some of these policies and make the change, but it's been three years since I met with um, Ari and others at the, at the gardens, and it's been at least 11 years since it was pretty well apparent that the property owner wanted to do something with the property. And I've run a nonprofit myself. I had to save a nonprofit from debts four times its annual budget. But I did it with help from my friends and help from the community. And I built what Arlie is talking about tonight, but I did it. And I didn't, I'm just not seeing the hustle. I'm not seeing that, I'm not seeing the, the there there yet. And I sympathize, I really do. But it's just not there. And I feel that unfortunately some, some folks in the community are not, you're not, you don't have the whole story. You don't know the whole history and that's unfortunate and it's not your fault. It's not at all your fault. I just encourage you to stay engaged. I'm still voting the way I am and I really encourage other commissioners to vote that way as well so we don't end up with a split decision tonight. And I will point out there are a couple opportunities coming up for you to get involved in a greater, higher level policy picture here in San Jose. One of them is the council priority setting session. This happens I think twice a year where the council, the city council gets together and decides, hey, what kind of new policies do we want to explore? What do we want to tell staff to focus on? And what do we want to, what do we envision for the future of policy in our city, right? You can bring something forward, talk to your local council member and get them to champion something that could really make the change you're trying to see. The second thing is this fall, the general plan, which was already referenced tonight. We have a four year review. Every four years, this document gets reviewed and updated. We're having a four year review process beginning this fall. Two of these commissioners will be sitting on that uh, task force is going to be reviewing it along with a ton of other community members and leaders. You are more than welcome to participate in that process, comment on that process, get involved in that process. I encourage you to do it. I encourage everyone to do it because that's how we make lasting change. That way we're not having proxy wars about a half acre site. Okay, we're talking about bigger picture. We're talking about how can we force the Googles to do something bigger for the community. And we're not having proxy wars over every single parcel in San Jose because it's not going to work, folks. It's not, we're not going to get anywhere. So I implore my, council, my fellow commissioners to, sorry, I almost said council members. I really did want to be on the council. I really did. <laughs> I implore my fellow commissioners to vote in favor, of, in favor of the denial and to avoid potential legal entanglements. And again, I really do appreciate everyone for coming out tonight, even the ones who think I'm a jerk for having to say this. And I'm just going to make one final comment and, um, and uh, allay the mystery that I, I will be supporting the motion. Um, uh, and um, I just want to say, I mean, based on what I heard from the applicant, it sounds like you have a very sincere um, person here who has wanted to wanted to try to work with the community on this. And the way that this is structured, there is still time to, and, and the staff is building in an extra two years potentially to bring those conversations that are sound like they're going on to fruition. And there are great opportunities with Google here, um, or planning to be here. So I think there is time, and I think there's a willing partner. Um, and so that gives me hope that, that there can be um, a win for the community. And then I just wanted to put a plug um, and implore the, the applicant, you know, um, if, it, you know, assuming this project goes forward, as I said, I was not impressed with the design. Um, many people are here who live in the community. This is, this is our community. This is where we live. Um, we'll be losing something special and it needs to be replaced with something even more special from a design perspective. And what I saw was just kind of, you know, run of the mill, blah stuff. So I would just implore you, if there's an opportunity to do something that is really more respectful of the character of this community, 
um, and really put a there there with a new building, um, I would just ask that you, you consider that. And with that, if there's nothing more, then I will call for a vote. Um, and yep, we'll do it one at a time, starting with Commissioner Allen. Aye. Nay. Equally aye. <laughs> All right, motion carries. What, what was that, four to two? Four to two. You can do my math. Um, thank you to everybody for coming out today. I know that for many of you that wasn't the decision that you wanted, and I'm being... Yes. So did you want me to state that? Um, the appeal was denied and the permit was approved. All right, so moving on to the next item on our agenda. Um, under number six, referrals from city council board commissions or other agencies, it looks like there's no items and I'm just gonna check with staff to make sure that that's true. Um, number seven is good and welfare, report from city council. Um, there was no city council. Ah. Or it's no tie July, so no, no report. Except for, except for today. All right, then moving on to the approval of the minutes. Does anyone? So moved. No. No. It's There's done. a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. All right. Who seconded? I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> and I'm going to recuse myself since I wasn't there or abstain, whatever the appropriate thing to do is. But all those in favor of the minutes say aye. 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 All those in opposition? Oh, hold, hold on one second. There is a correction. Okay. I believe the actual adjournment time Please. was 7.56, not 8.06. Do you want to change the motion? Yeah. Can you adjust that, please? Is that, is that, is that material? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, um, did the maker of the motion agree to amend the? Yes. All right, let that be reflected. That what was the change, I'm sorry? Adjournment was 7.56, not 8.06. See, my watch was different. Did you write it down? <laughs> All right, uh, any opposition to that motion? And one abstention or recusal, whatever I'm supposed to do. Uh, going on to C, subcommittee <laughs> formation, reports, and outstanding business. Anything? Michael, anything? Uh, no, no, I don't have anything. Do you guys have anything? No. Commission calendar and study sessions. Anything on that? I have a question. Do you feel that the next meeting will have something on the agenda? Next scheduled meeting? I cannot answer that question at this moment. How is the pipeline of applications? Do you, does it look thin, thick? Hey John, do you have any idea? Um, I think some of the applicants have taken the summer off. There are plenty of projects as staff will contest. Um, I can't call off the top of my head. Fair much. enough. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Oh, sorry, Commissioner, oh, sorry, yeah, Commissioner Libre, well, I was just going to ask to the point of calendar, is, is there a standing calendar of when these things are, are coming up? Are you talking about hearings or what are you talking about? Like hearings and projects come into commission. We generally won't notify you guys in advance of a project coming up specifically, but the hearings for the planning commission and all those should be posted. Well, I know that hearing dates are all posted. I have, I have the calendar and it's in the agenda, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, I was just thinking as far as the pipeline of when projects are coming down the line. And the, part of the reason I ask is, you know, we get notices of, ERRs being ready and this and that. And if if I'm not reading very thoroughly or staying on those, then it's like, bang, 600 pages for next Wednesday. So it'd be nice to know when the biggies are coming down the line and you know have a little more advance notice, that's all. I believe yeah. it's tough. We have, we, I think we have to make the documents available to you at the same time as the public. It's very hard to try to hit those timelines specifically, okay. but if I really can't promise anything, okay. I would just I would encourage Vice Chair Leba to embrace surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Allen, do you have something to add? Well, um, Commissioner Leba, I do I do recognize that you have only served on the commission for a little over a year now, but in my experience, I've just learned to expect the worst. 
So I budget, <laughs> I budget time according to the very first packet I received, which probably uh, increased the weight of my car by at least twofold when I put it in the passenger seat. So um, I just want to point out uh, for the chair's uh, information, I will uh, be absent from the August 28th Planning Commission meeting and unable to conference. But I will reconstitute myself before I return. <laughs> I love that word. Um, Cheater in the flash. All right. Anything under E, the public record? Anyone want to say anything? All right. Thank you all. Um, meeting adjourned. At 9.26 p.m. <laughs>